Greetings there everyone and welcome back to TNO The Lasses of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Uh, Dai Nippon Taikoku Lover. But right now, we gotta talk about the hands of the law and then a couple comments. The meeting was brief and rather underblown. The head of the department called up Tachi and Kodaira with a subtle but noticeable note of annoyance in his voice. He tersely congratulated them on their good work and then sent them back without a further word, as soon as the meeting was over. He called them back to speak with them privately, contradicting his praise from just a few moments ago, he chastised the two. His voice was constantly on the edge of true and furious anger. He explained, or exclaimed that the two had gone simply too far in the pursuit of justice and had not just put the department but all the police of Japan in a dangerous situation. He explained that while the police were furious, public perception and demand for justice had forced him to take the detective's side. Preparations were already being made to obtain huge amounts of warrants and the authority to arrest many high in position or many in high positions of power. The department had shook his head and told the two detectives that if this ended poorly, they were no longer just endangering themselves, but in fact almost everyone in the Japanese police. He concluded by saying that he hoped to match, or hoped to the heavens, that Tachi and Kodera could handle what was coming. We do too, but like I said, a couple comments. Actually, we've got quite a few comments to go through, such as, uh, let's see, uh, a lot of you guys said the three-hour episode may be a bit much. Um, if I do another three-hour episode sometime, obviously this video is not three hours, but if I do it ever again, uh, maybe put some time steps, which is a good point, I forgot about that. Holy crap, we need a lot more grid power, don't we? Building grid power, oh my gosh. Yeah, we definitely need to get some more grid power here. Uh, nuclear reactors, uh, I love nuclear reactors. I love them so much. You know what, that's what we're gonna build next. We are really, really lacking for nuclear reactors or just power in general. Let's go three at a time, cause that looks actually really bad. I'm glad I looked at this right now immediately. Power in every state is modified by the local resource factor. Oh boy, that's not good, but yeah, in the future, on this channel, if I do something like that, I'll probably try, I'll attempt to put in timestamps. And if I forget to put in timestamps, uh, if someone could like tell me or put in the comments, and I'll probably pin the comment if I forget to do something like that again. So, actually, if you guys want, uh, if someone does like put timestamps in for the videos, I'll pin it to the video. So, thank you regardless. Uh, someone okay. So next one would be don't do the Kishi no Nobusuke route because it has a fail-safe system. That's why I open this thing up here. The Kishi route. Of course, we have Kido. We have uh, the Takagi, yeah, the Admiral. We have Independence, of course. We also have, who's this guy? Who's the conservative here? Oh, Eno, Eno Hiroya, of course, duh. And then we have Kaya here as well. They are who they are. Let's see, someone says, is there a path for animator manga Japan? Hmm, maybe. Uh, am I going to do an Order 44 Kishi route? Now, I've heard that they removed, the, the devs removed Order 44 route, sort of like that. I could be wrong at the time of recording since I don't know exactly what's happened. That's why we're playing through this campaign again, sort of, not really again, since we're not going down the same route. Uh, someone asked, actually a lot of people have asked if I can do a reformist route. Um, the first time I played Japan, the only other time I played the Japan, at the time I was recording, when TNO first came out, was the reformist route under Takagi, so I don't want to do that route again. I would like to again sometime, but I want to see a different path for Japan, as much as I, as much as support as there is for a reformist route for this campaign, I think it'd be better if we went down, as some, a couple other people recommended, like the Kaio route, the Technocrat route, just to see what it's like, to see if it's any different than the reformist route. I don't mind doing Takagi again, but I want to try someone else out for this, for this campaign, at the very least. Someone asked if we can play as North Korea. Uh, no, no, North Korea is pretty North Korean for now, so it is what it is. Let's see, and someone says there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of support for performance, like I said. Someone also says watch for the Middle East and Madagascar. Well, yeah, there's a way to get Iran into the our faction as well as we did complete uh, Madagascar last time. But the press release: the day was cold and rainy, torrents of sharp droplets barraging the miserable crowd. No one really wanted to be there, except they all wanted to know what was happening. They all had been waiting for almost an hour, and though they had all had a vague and worrying idea of what was to be announced, they wanted to know the full extent. Finally, Tachi and Kodara made their way to the podiums. Kodara did the majority of the talking, giving a somber greeting before getting into the actual investigation. He described the initial murder and how the case had slowly escalated the further down they had gone. Eventually, he had got to what they would really turn heads around for. He described the discovery of a vast network of illegal arms dealing in general corruption centered on the army and navy, but also reaching into other areas of Japanese government and, of course, society. The instant those words left his mouth, he was drowned up by shouts and yells from the crowd. The questions of journalists, the gasps of workers, and the anger of the army navy servicemen were far too much. A group of soldiers from the army men even attempted to rush a stage in outrage and were only barely stopped by the police officers. The two detectives had to be escorted 
back to safety. They looked at each other with fear in their eyes. They could no longer have any assurances of their own physical security. It was too late for that. The things people do to stop the truth. Oh boy. It's going to hurt the economy. I hope not. I really hope our economy is going to be remain the same. We have no crises. We have a surplus of $6.68 billion. That's actually really awesome. Dead's going down quite a nice rate, but the calm the government's fears. Kodaira sighed. He had been in this meeting for over an hour, and during hatred, fear, and absolute contempt from those who had supposedly had the same ideas and goals as he did. A government where exposing corruption and malpractice got you nothing but spite was not one that Kodaira wanted to serve, but he knew that these were just bad apples and the still staying and proud tree that was his nation. He assured the politicians time and time again that he was only trying to bring justice and serve Japan, not harm it, but his assurances fell on deaf ears. These people wanted the status quo, even if the status quo was wrong. The meeting eventually began to fall apart completely. Kodaira talked less and less, and with shock, he noted that the representatives had started to argue with each other as much as they were going to argue with him soon. They seemed to have forgotten him entirely and were biting and yelling at each other with seething rage. Each blamed the branch on that some other politician was representing. Kodaira had not realized that until now, just how deep he and his team had struck at Japan. The branches and fruits were not all that were spoiled. The very roots were rotting away, and if he had not acted and revealed it, the whole tree would have collapsed, even now. The whole system seemed on the brink of collapse. Kodaira silently hoped that he had done the right thing. Is there anyone innocent in this entire darn government? And calmed the team's fears. Tachi waited at the complex with his team. It was so sudden that one could hear a needle drop on the other side of the building. The entire team had become very worried as of late. Their enemies' numbers grew by the day. Every morning, a new outrage letter from the Kenpai Tire, threat by the Navy. It had gotten so bad that the team members did not just fear for the work, jobs, or even freedom, but for their very lives. There seemed to be very real fear of murderous retribution from those they brought justice to. Tachi decided he needed to do something. He stood up and addressed all the team members present. He said he knew how bad it felt, how scary it was, but that they would all be okay. Their foes had no reason to kill them. If anything, if they killed the team, they would only be proving their own guilt. However, he also said that revenge often outweighed treason, uh, or reason. And to keep alert, the team members should be, all be on guard and ready to move their families to the complex if needed. Would our enemies dare to stoop so low? And I wanted to get to at least the next month before the crisis happens, so we have an uprising at Uralgio, just because I wanted to lower the debt just slightly more. Reports from the police garrison in Uralgio described an intensified amount of nationalist voices, or violence, from the non-Yamato subjects. Both Manchu radicals and the Russian minority in the city have launched attacks against the central police precinct and army supply lines. For the past week, Local Kenpai Tai uh, uh, forces have been working diligently to find and isolate the subversive elements, and many have now had their addresses raid. Hmm, I don't know where it is. Uh, interrogating the terrorists did not bear much fruit in the realm of useful intelligence, uh, but many of them were found with American-made weapons on their persons as of now. The situation in Manchuria was normalized. We'll keep be keeping a closer eye on the region from here on out. Oh, it's a lot of stock, basically. Interesting. Is it going up or down? 7% is too high. For me, it seems like it's going down. 6.9%, not bad. Oh, the old garb. Wun Zhu rarely got to visit her grandmother. The train's fare was pricey for her parents, and the old woman had ever more difficulty caring for them in her old age. She told stories to her in Jun Yeol of the old Korea, how she walked a, watched a parade with the last king, Sung Jong. This time was no different. The archaic village had not changed one bit, save for a few more homes with electric lights. Wun Zhu's grandmother greeted them with hugs and kisses, as she always did, and the family enjoyed a simple but filling dinner. The octogenarian returned to the table after some time, revealing a splendid set of clothes. Grandmother, that's a handbook. Or hanbok. There's pictures of them in her history books. She smiled at her young granddaughter before handing out the outfit to her. It was her own handbook, sued by the youth's great-grandmother. Jun Yo ran his hand along the soft rami or rami cloth, flicking the frayed tassels that hung from the skirt. Wang Ju could only look in awe. The clothes may have been fit for a museum display, but she felt in her a sense of duty to wear it at least once. Only the old folks wore them in the cities where most people follow the new fashions from Tokyo. Holding it up to her own body, she saw the proportions were nearly the same. The seas may have to be fixed, but it was perfect fit otherwise. But once she returned back to her city, this dress brought only curiosity and amusement by her friends. They joked that she would look like a peasant from the history books, a museum dummy. And while Wang Ju could let the insult slide, however, they were intended, perhaps, the world was not ready yet for the old fashions to come in style again. Save for the moths and jeers of school children, a ch culture's colors fade away. Brace for the storm. Tachi and Kodar sipped each sip from their tea, making small talk that neither cared the slightest bit, bit about. The clock above their heads ticked slowly, each little click a second closer to total chaos. The two detectives had never even guessed what they were getting into all those months ago. Just a standard murder. Nobody. <clears throat> Just a nobody pawn in the machine, Kodara remarked that he almost wished that they had never found the greater truth. That they could have just continued as normal, lived their lives, done their jobs, the normal stuff. Around them, the department was going into full lockdown. All the evidence, captives and documents were being moved around, shuffled away, and hidden in locations undisclosed to even most of the officers. 
They had reached a point they had prayed they would never come, but there was a rumor that someone perhaps can't fight time. Perhaps the Navy, even the government itself, was going to attack. Be it desperately save themselves or simply out of pure revenge, they would have vengeance. The government was in absolute chaos and would likely not protect the department. Who knew how long there would, might even be a government for, even if the department survived this attack. It was an even slimmer chance that they would make it through om the almost certainly upcoming power struggle. All they could do was pray and fight like they had hoped that they would never have to. May there be mercy upon us. Because Japan is about to collapse. Uh, maybe? Maybe? Maybe. We'll see. Improve relations? Well, at this point, I don't think it's going to really matter too much. Guarantee the support of at least 229 MPs to vote with us on any bill? Ron Soldier's money chips. Day by day, the crowds gathered around the HQ of the Army Navy grew. Since the press release, the public had been up in arms, and rare was a day that passed without an attack on a high-level military officer. Police officers could do, no longer intervene. The hate was mutual, and the internal police was fighting for its life. The IJA and N were, for all intents and purposes, dead in the water. Caldera and Tachi should have been celebrating at this point. Their prime targets have been proved demonstrably guilty. But two niggling issues haunted them, two loose ends begging for resolution. The first was drawn from the use of several code words drawn from conversations and interrogations with various military staff. The names of famous cultural landmarks, Kamakura Buddha, Kyoto Golden Temple, Kyoto Silver Temple. All code words owners were spoken of in a deferential tone and appeared to have pulled strings behind the string pullers. But the transactions traceable to these code word accounts did not correspond to the Navy or Army. In fact, even the Imperial Guard headquarters appeared to be innocent. So, who was above the HQ? The second was this. The Army and Navy, the civilian government's biggest enemies, were busy collapsing, so why was the civilian government failing or falling to pieces along with them? And did anyone really want to know the answer? I don't like where this is going. But I do like getting better infantry anti-tank. That, my friends, is nice. Um, anything else around here? Marines? Yeah, let's do Marines. Just we're going to be using them in the future anyways. Even though we're waiting for, uh... Things to collapse here too, aren't we? The press room was ranked with, from consecutive days of public hearings, but not from sweat or exhaustion. No, the scent of fear was heady, or, and it was everywhere. The team wore the expressions of children with their hands caught deep in the cookie jar. Ironic, given the circumstances, but nobody was laughing. Kodaira's speech was short to the point of curtness. To prevent further internal interference, a private commission would be set up with the facilitation of the Tokyo Metropolitan and granted extraordinary powers to search, arrest, and interrogate all across the branches of government. It was the will of the Emperor, and here he paused for emphasis. That the investigation reached just conclusions. Scarcely had the meeting ended when a note was passed to him by a staffer. It was impossible even to catch his disappearing outline in the crowd of journalists. Kodaira opened the hole, or opened the note, noting the letterhead. Stop before you are encircled and destroyed. Your fight was brave, but it ends here. You, we are watching. Yours, a thousand temples. Baffled, he raised his head just in time to catch Tachi's cry. Kodera, our leads in the Navy are in trouble. Order from the Diet. I sent to Fukushima. Where the heck is that? Actually, we have about three weeks left for strategic cycles. Faster, further, deeper. As the team hastily reassembled their work, damage reports confirmed the worst. Some kind of purge was taking place in the Army Navy ministries, and was being directed not by the command staff, but from the dizzying heights of civilian bureaucracy. Some of the prominent leads have been caught up in the chaos. Something was very wrong. Kodera and Tachi were running out of time. The crisis meeting stretched hours into into the night. Many of them on the team had let their unspoken fears take hold of them and wanted to shut down the investigation before their own heads wound up on executive platters. What emerged was a consensus that the work had to be done as quickly as possible to attempt to outflank the government. Arrest warrants and lists of suspects were hastily compiled, and the team divided into minist ministry sections to tackle each list to hit the government as hard as they could. If they couldn't manage a full sweep of the thousand temples, they could at least nab enough of them to kill momentum. Nobody said the obvious, but it was on their minds regardless. Time was the only assurance they had left, and the results had to come in before their own arrest did. The Japanese police had a 99% conviction rate, even for their own men. We're working for a gosh darn lives out here. Council? Very cool. But you're from on high. Everyone knew that the Bureau of Public Order, in theory the civilian police's representative to the Emperor, was in reality a fair-weather friend of the Juniors. The Bureau seldom did its assigned work these days, focusing instead on arcane power games and the Byzantine structure of the Empire. Even so, nobody had quite expected the about-face about the Bureau now made. In orders crafted to maximize humiliation, the Bureau essentially dressed down the entire team for acting above their pay grade, station, and status before the Emperor. This was fairly normal treatment, and to be expected, but was surprised the team was a blunt demand of the corpus of the investigation of evidence and all to be moved to a Bureau HQ and safe kept for an indefinite period. The reasons cited were the preservation of the dignity of the government and the Emperor as well as need to safeguard potentially sensitive data, uninspiring but effective. In ordinary circumstances, the orders ordered them uh, to, uh, to stop could have at least been published, but this order was classified so highly that to release it would have been an immediate death sentence for most of Kodaira and Tachi's team. It was an outrage and an impediment of justice, but you could admire their handiwork. Dazed and confused, the team halted work. 
Amesso, seething with rage and vitriol is wrapped and redraft and hastily sent to the shredder before it could do any harm. Stabbed in the back and there to blame, resistance from without. No one was sure when the low-grade civil war brewed in the Diet and in the Imperial government at large had quieted into a simmer, but somehow the worst had passed. Nobody knew why, but most of the team were thankful that the worlds around them had remained somewhat intact, even as the military fell apart. It was reassuring to know that Japan hadn't yet become a military state, and was in fact increasingly unlikely to do so given the state of its armed forces. One evening a letter was received from the Imperial government, uh, HQ, an anonymous typescript and generic government-issued letterhead. It was similar in content to countless other missives received that week, all of which ordered the team to cease and desist under the pretext of protecting the dignity of the Emperor. What was different was what came afterwards. The signage of the letter read like a who's who of the most powerful members of the Imperial government. Senior members of the Diet and Cabinet, the Army, Navy, and HQ itself had all penned signatures in person. Godera's files indicated that half of these individuals were embroiled in intrigue against each other in the upper heavens of the government's chambers. If this were the case, how did they all end up signing the same petition? The answer arrived in the form of a team from the HQ the following week, brandishing a warrant for the immediate audit of suspected treasonous activities against the Emperor. As they searched the office, ignoring the cries of the already overburdened investigation team, Kodara found in their warrant the seals of a half dozen major ministerial appointments, but above them was the thick, unmistakable uh, seal of Kusai's council. It was not clear to everyone who the Thousand Temples were and why the government had closed ranks. What could be done to stop them, however? My gosh, how deep does this run? Extraordinarily deep. As we get to the next event, please. The government lockdown. Kodara was tired, even by the standards of the Metropolitan Police of the Jewel of the East. A sleepless man for a sleepless city, dancing on the edge of collapse. The investigation and months of his team's time appeared to be slipping into the gutter, and there was little he could do to stop it. It was reminded of the old stories of children playing with the gods, pretending at equal status. He poured through the documents, the seals on the letter corresponding to senior positions in the government, but they seemed to have come from somewhere else. Analysis of the seals and prints revealed that this was a wax used for financial purposes. Why had the letter been stamped with accounting seals rather than executive order ones? And what did this mean for the investigation. A cursory search of the invoicing records the team had captured revealed nothing. All the seals they had on record correspond to senior executives, whose name they already knew in the ministry slate for audit. Pictures of contracts they captured revealed nothing as well. The seals' identity and function eluded them. Coderre worked through the night, chasing the newspaper and expanding spirals, and by the next morning he had an answer for a very confused Tachi. The seals in the letter had been found in the Minazaka records they'd seized in the fishing factory, and the peculiar thing was that the seals hadn't been found in an isolated one or two places out of 371 documents seized by the internal an initial investigation. 320 of them had a match for one or more seals used. It had slipped past the initial investigation. Most government firms had ministerial seals for documentation and approval, but it can no longer be ignored. The government wasn't above the scandal. It was right there in the mud with the rest of them. Another set of criminals to chase. Oh boy, how deep is this rabbit hole going to go? Very, very deep. The facade cracks. They trained Tachi in rudimentary middleman tactics and hostage negotiation seminars, but he had never expected to use them like this. The two teams of the most powerful agencies in Japan were snapping at each other, with members of his own team desperately trying to get both sides to stand down, hands to holster, so the police department had it with his breath. The Imperial Government, uh, the Imperial General Headquarters, had sent a team of special bureaucrats to commandeer what evidence could be taken to safeguard it for the Emperor's protection in a facility guarded by themselves. It was unfortunate that they had happened to meet a team from the Bureau of Public Order sent to commandeer what evidence could be taken for the exact same purpose. Now they glared at each other, the team heads practically throwing warrants at each other in efforts to prove the other an inferior in carrying out the Emperor's will. Looking at the two of them, Tachi had an idea. Didn't the Art of War say that the enemies were best defeated when divided? And didn't they possess a significant reserves of evidence that everyone wanted, but only one agency could keep? The plan formed in his mind then, and fettered through the rest of the day into a full-blown strategy. If they could pull it off, survival would be a possibility. And some hope was better than none at all. Divide, conquer, and survive. We're almost so close to the end of the month. I don't want the economy to crash yet, but chinks in the armor. At this point, the team was so used to overnight meetings called at an hour's notice that scarcely anyone really cared about the infringement on personal time. Between the ten or so members gathered only a couple of children, and all were so exhausted by the investigative efforts that few had actually visited their parents in months. Even so, they hoped perhaps this would be the last push, the final struggle to some imagined victory, and that as the details were laid out in the flickering lights of the room, the only... That hope only grew. Kodara and Tachi reorganized the team for the upteenth time, focusing on three major conflicts vectors under the ragged Imperial umbrella, the Bureau of Public Order, the Diet and the Army and the Navy. The latter were undergoing a full-scale internal reorganization, complete with occasional gunfights, but still possessed enough internal cohesion to be a potential threat to the other two. And the plan was simple at heart. Turn the three agencies against each other in such a way that the conflict would escalate and spill into the courts, forcing the release of documents they needed. The Trojan Horse, lay ready for entrance into three separate Troys, a series of invoices with seals from all three agencies with Minazaka logistics. Army, money, and Navy shipping, more than enough to nab all three, but just enticing enough to convince each agency to fight the other two for ownership, and if all three agencies were to be seduced at the same time, Tachi smiled, it was time to turn the government upside down, one last roll to die, one last gambit. 
3.133%. Yeah, we do have fresh all the presses. We could do instead uh, count our pennies to lower inflation, which is okay for now. By poverty, which I do like a lot, but then we power things up, which actually wouldn't be bad as well, but still. Uh, wave a false hope of the soldiers. Kodera's contacts in the military had dried up faster than a Saharan drought after the investigation started to have real repercussions, but he knew that they were one of the last hopes for the two detectives. The entire government and the military were gunning to seize the evidence and shut down the investigation, and Kodara knew that they were all in far too deep of a hole to let this go. He would see the justice or die trying, and he would only take any help he could get to see that happen. Serve his old contacts, people who he had once considered true friends, flat out refused to meet with him. Eventually, however, he had met one of the few of them. Those who knew that there was no other option, the offer was simple. They and their soldiers and the army and navy would safeguard evidence pertinent to the investigation. In return, their reputation could still be safeguarded, and perhaps they would survive and make it to the other side after this whole debacle settled down. Every time he made the offer, he knew it was a lie, but the people he talked to were so desperate for any chance to escape that they agreed. Even hope that they knew deep down was false was better than the ch chasm that faced them currently. Caldera just wished that he'd never put themselves in situations, or he, that they'd never put themselves in the situation in the first place. One last favor, old friends, and wink at the bureau. Wink, wink. Tachi was tired. He had been working non-stop for literal months now. He could truly not remember the last time he had slept properly. He got him five hours of sleep a few weeks ago and it felt like an eternal slumber compared to what he was usually running on. This general tiredness made it extremely difficult to conduct a proper meeting with an outside representative, which is exactly what Tachi was trying to do. A lot of hung on this meeting, and if the bureau chose not to comply, it could be the straw that broke the camel's back. Tachi decided to, for once in this entire ordeal, cut off crap and talk frankly, no more flowery language, and dancing around what was really on the table. He set out the offer as too so. The Bureau of Public Order would assist in the storage and safekeeping of evidence so that hostile and potentially corrupt forces within the government could not seize them in exchange. Tashi promised that if the evidence was secured, then the investigation could be turned to politically benefit the Bureau. His upfront manner surprised the people he was meeting with, but the response was promising. They continued their endless games of double meanings and non incriminating incriminating, vague half-statements, but Tachi was able to gather they were accepting the deal. He left the building with a tad of optimism and had resolved to take a nap sometime. They might just help us. And smile at the ministers. The offer, uh, offer was transparent appeasement at best. That was really the best that could be managed. And given the dire straits that every branch of the government were in, even if even an offer like this could easily be the best one the die might receive, after all. They were on the brink, too, and they would have to take any opportunity possible to try and save themselves at what seemed like the entire government collapsing around them in the bro boiling sea of corruption and disorganization. Their proposal was simple. If ordered to be long-winded and noble to fly to the die, given the conflicts of interest everywhere else in the government and the possibility for further damage, the die was the best organization left to safeguard evidence <clears throat> regarding the investigation. <clears throat> Their corporation, cooperation would surely shield them from much of the upcoming chaos, and their assistance would prove their dedication to justice and innocence of the many Diet members. They would safeguard the evidence from the corrupt and prying eyes elsewhere in the government and Navy, reaping all the benefits of doing so. Tachi and Kodaro had worded the letter to be just right, hopefully appealing to the sense of urgency and desire to remain safe that the Diet members all felt. They hoped that it would be enough to win an ally, at least for a moment. Flattery is an ever-powerful tool. Oh, look at all that uh, energy we have now. 185. Release the bait. As Tachi spoke into the microphone, Kodaira anxiously watched his side. His voice trembled with a sense that every word he gave to the radio waves would be quoted in Japanese history books forever. The inner circle of the government and the investigation team selected to release the transaction's <coughs> invoice's history, and an extensive documentation is not an airtight one, yet the extraordinary circumstances they cite threaten the future of the entire nation itself. He ends the broadcast and sends the files to the officials listening in shock, and then less than an hour later, the three agencies are set aflame. With the crimes of the Army, Navy, and Diet implicated with dozens of pieces of evidence for the every transgression, government hearings have been filed and already set in order to acquire the darning F records. The halls of Tokyo are filled with the disorganized shouting and the exasperated screaming of those named, each agency clamoring for its access, each giving different reasons as to how they would fit in to secure it, for the good of the Japanese people and the Emperor. It seems that the desperation will be for naught. Can there ever be a victor? And we went to the next month just so we can get cut this down just a little bit more. 6.49 billion? Not bad. Divide, conquer, and retreat. If there was ever any hope in this crisis being resolved calmly and diplomatically, it's gone now. The common front entrusted with information has completely collapsed upon itself. Governmental officials have fallen upon each other, like a pack of starving rats stalking and praying at night, sensing weakness in the brethren. The cultivated contacts from the police have been put to effect and now offer to help put out all three agencies with their pursuits. The giant bureaucracies and entities controlling Japan will soon find themselves trapped by the rules they themselves made. The agencies have already hastily granted wide open access to the police investigation team, quickly moving to secure all the transcriptions. The hearings held themselves have resulted in the granting of access to voluminous incendiary material surrounding the agencies' dealings with each other. As all three players smear each other uh, with allegations and evidence, the hands of the puppet masters above all, or above, will never be clean again. Let's see what kind of trouble they can get themselves into. Strategic cycles. 
So we're gonna wait to see if this any this gives us anything else maybe later on. Uh, that's not bad actually. Production units. Hmm. I'm not sure we're gonna get any more land auction. Screw it. We're gonna just keep going down this way. And do we have a crisis yet? We're tumbling down. Prime Minister Ino Hiroya implicated in making concessions in over 30 key areas of military autonomy. Deputy Ikeda Hayato recently resigned, proven to accept hundreds of thousands of bribes from Foreign Minister Fujiyama Achiro to Security Minister Inukai Takeru. Hundreds of more names from the Army, Navy, and from the Dada all complicit their desperate scrambling to prevent the outflow of information horrifically failing. The list of names only grows in those who desire to be in the know and know now. It's only a matter of time before the headlines of newspapers will blare with the cries of corruption the pictures, ears, hearing past our best efforts at censorship. The situation has become evident that any hope of controlling the damage has been forgotten, if the past could ever be forgotten. As the bots is beginning to collapse and the cabinet reaches its end, it seems as if a new era for Japan is about to dawn. What's done is done. The government has let everyone in itself down. And it all becomes nothing. Hopefully poverty doesn't get any worse here. But we're probably going to have a crisis here on our hands. The accountant's new. Everyone was afraid now. The central board was riddled with notes of various fonts and styles, and the corridors of the rooms were trodden half to dust. But no one even dared to make a small talk. The energy was channeled into work so frantic it seemed like a burst of public madness. Talk veered and jolted between the talk of leaders and the next step the next agency to find. Kodaira and Tachi found solace in the most recent routine, to properly conduct an accounting audit. An uninvolved neutral agency had to be found they had devoted themselves to finding you, with a book of the utmost influential auditing agencies and accounting firms in Japan in hand. They hold themselves up in the rooms for weeks, working their way past the streams of data. Slowly the web began to unravel. The accountants involved had covered the tracks with exceedingly or exceeding competence, but certain irregular patterns were suspiciously similar to others, and if they could be proven to link to an accounting firm, the firm could be supposed to be compromised. The name of the firm was crossed out in the books and the search would continue. Name by name, number by number, the anonymity of the accountants began to collapse, and the list of the books grew shorter and shorter and broke into pieces, which shrunk and shrunk and shrunk again. One day, Kodaira woke up early, as was his nature, took a browse through the cross written book in the hall, and then another and another. He managed with great effort to keep from screaming, instead, he sunk into his chair, half sobbing to be found by a worried Tachi. Every single name in the book had been crossed out, oh my goodness, and the politicians knew. Things had been quiet for longer than they had been, in the weeks when the messenger appeared in front of the department. His message was sure and tersely delivered. The government would, would comply with the investigation to its fullest ability. <clears throat> he brought with him dozens of binders, each big enough to carry perhaps a year's worth of data. They were all quickly dropped off and their representative left. Tachi and Kodaira were quickly informed. They looked at each other for a moment, sharing a glance of simultaneous eagerness, fear, and confusion, before quickly standing up and heading down to grab the binders. After a few trips back and forth to gather all, they each grabbed the top binder in their stacks and started to read. Both their binders contained the same general kinds of info, but it was not pretty. All the transcripts were true, paper after paper documented truly staggering amounts of money flowing from the Navy and Army into the accountants of politicians. The further they read, the higher profile the names became. Soon they were no longer just reading the reports, just skimming and nothing and noting every single name they came across. Not a single innocent person was mentioned from the front to the back. Kodara picked up another binder, having already gone through several and started to read. This one was different, however. This did not document any suspicious transactions or politicians, at least not in the same way or the other. This was a full government-oriented report on the state of corruption. It had been chartered and viewed by the highest in the government, and then tossed aside a single note at this end, stated that the report was to be archived in high clearance storage and forgotten for the security of Japan. No, for the security of the people running it. The rot sinks deeper. And deeper and deeper. They all knew. Shinzo Sojima gave a brief resignation speech, showing no emotion and leaving as quickly as possible. He was found in the morning, dead for approximately four hours. He was on his side, keeled over into a shadow pool of his own blood. His hands still gripped the hilt of a very old and expensive uh, wakazashi, a centuries-old antique and one of his most prized possessions. His face was frozen in a sad frown, his eyes as empty, dead as they had been when he announced his resignation. Or whenever I wake up. The police quickly rushed to inform his son, but they found him missing too. There was a brief panic until it was discovered that he had skipped town on a plane less than an hour after his father's body had officially been found. He was on his way to India, officially on business, in truth because the entire world was collapsing around him. There was little chance of catching him now, and even less reason in trying. Just a few hours later, yet another heap of documents emerged. The Minazaka Corporation was now shown to have almost certainly assisted the government, army and navy with their operations as well. They had used their business expertise and many assets to shuffle money around, skim just enough for nobody to notice and keep anyone who might object off the scent. Or off the scent. They had even audited the vast majority of the accounts involved in order to keep suspicion at minimum. Every level of power was now implicated. With solid evidence, hardly an innocent soul remained. Let he who was without sin cast the first stone. Well, I'd be casting lots of stones regardless.
Can this get improved empty air? Let the bodies hit the floor, which is an old song. Kodara poured a glass of whiskey for himself and immediately drank it down before pouring himself another and offering one to Tachi. The young one rarely accepted. He had been avoiding alcohol as much as he ever could over the past few days, given the concentration needed for his work, but he just couldn't take it anymore. He took the glass with a mumbled thanks and savored the harsh flavor. As the ranking officer poked in his head and delivered some more papers, Kodara initially tried to decline, saying to just put it in the side so they could get it to the due time, but the officer said this was different. They had just come from the Eno clique itself. That got Kodara to stand up and snatch the papers right off from the officer's hand. He struggled to keep his eyes steady as it ran up and down the paper. He sat and sat down before handing the tiny stack to Tachi. The younger detective read over them as well, then looked at Kodara in shock. The clique was now agreeing to cooperate with the investigation fully. Anything the team asked for, as long as it was relevant to the case, would be delivered. All they wanted in exchange was a guarantee of safety. The Inu clique would be secure, and in return, everything and everyone would be fair game. Pour another glass. 95.2% debt to GDP ratio. 6.47 billion in reserves. The verdict. The final hearings were miserable affairs. Each one was just hour after hour details of the truly, hideously, astoundingly corrupt affairs of nearly every branch of the nation. After they were completed, the last pieces of evidence had finally been officially compiled and reviewed and were incorporated into the report. The report was titanic, large enough to make one wonder if every citizen in the Empire was being accused. After a final day of nervous preparations and finalizations, the report was released. By the next day, literally hundreds of arrest warrants had been issued. Diet members, cabinet members, politicians, businessmen, previously admirable figures, all were stopped and brought in as mere criminals. They were joined by a staggering amount of generals, admirals, and officers, both major and minor. A good number were yet to be captured and they continued to trickle in as the fallout grew harsher. The Minnesota Corporation was on the absolute brink of collapse. The vast majority of its remaining leadership had been incarcerated, and what little remained was extraordinarily unprepared to deal with this. It was teetering it would be knocked over by a slight breeze or push, and this was more akin to a city shredding hurricane. Every sign pointed to a collapse in consumer confidence. There was no coming back for the Minnesota Corporation. There was no coming back for anybody. The horizon glows with fire, not light. Oh god, we're going to lose stability and political power. We, I do want to keep some political power as much as I can right now, just so that, just in case we want to get Italy in the Cold Prosperity Spheres, if it's still possible. And the Yasuda Crisis. Well, with uh, Hitler dead now and uh, a government collapse, it is what? Oh God! Oh God! And emergency reforms. The Japanese economy is shambles. Reeling from the effects of the Yasuda crisis, a fail, false dose of muster response. Many of the steps forward may, uh, towards recovery may not be popular, but will prove to be necessary if we want to ensure a speedy recovery to normalcy. Oh crap! Conservative power decreased by a certain amount. Inflation will decrease by 0.2 percent. Oh, poverty will begin to improve. Oh God! Oh God! How's the economy? Oh my god, point four oh my good lord. Oh no, 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 no. Oh, that's that immediately shut up. Okay, we're exceptional still. Not bad. Not bad. You know, it's better than what I thought. We still have a surplus. Mmm. Um Conservative support, 155. Oh, we can interact with them. Oh, we could have done this too. Power increases. Use the public. Public approval decreases. Power goes up. Launch propaganda campaigns. Support of the House of Peers goes up. Public approval goes up. That's all I want to say, conservative. Wow. Austerity measures. Growth will decrease. Inflation will decrease. Poverty will slowly worsen. Bailing out struggling businesses. Income tax cuts. Growth will increase. Income tax will decrease. Oh my gosh. Poverty will get better. Oh my gosh. Uh... Privatize state assets. Get more liquid reserves. Reduce military spending. Inflation will decrease by 0.2. Minimum wage reforms. Um, that doesn't do very much. Poverty will get better. Whatever poverty's at, we just gotta focus on poverty. Poverty is the most important one right now, compared to anything else, in my opinion. I mean, growth is still important. Don't get me wrong, but um, well, poverty will begin to improve. Prop up the agricultural sector. Oh boy. Oh boy. So when do we get the next focus read? My god, 0.42%? Jesus Christ. Oh, we still have surplus. Oh, real. Oh, that's. Mm, mm. That's a lot of inflation and, like, no growth. The blitz begins. First report. Oh, crap. That's not good. 
or the outpost miles ahead of the front. Most were small and concealable, barely two stories tall and made of straw and nipa, connected to the rest of the world by the old ham radios and signal fires. For the most of the war, they spotted movement without being spotted themselves, but this morning their greatest strength became their greatest weakness. Most fell silent before they could tell the army something was, of course, afoot. Next were the villages and barrios along the front. Any other day in the villages would wake in the early hours to prepare for the harvest. Men with guns by the hundreds forestalled their daily routine as houses and fields were captured without a shot. Some runners evaded notice to make for civilization. Third were the city outskirts, better defended than the backwater hovels in the provinces. It is here where the armed men met other armed men and traded bullets and shells as the sun peaked above the horizon. Precincts and received the uh, outpost distress messages and the r village runners. Riders' explosions claimed the lives of a dozen constabularies. constabularies. Death itself himself had roused the townsmen from their sleep. Last to see them all was Manila, the Pearl of the Orient. From a distance, pillars of black smoke rose with the morning sun. Gunshots and explosions intertwined and formed hollow, echoing staccatos so far away, yet so close all the same. Only now did the army receive its report. Positions overrun, casualties reported, barrios lost, and cities besieged from Pampanga to the Negros. In a span of four hours, both rebel groups were less than a hundred miles from the Malacanan Palace. The war's final phase begins in earnest. Oh, crap. Well, at least we can send Oh, you're finding two groups. Well, dude, bro. You're gonna send Nishi. Um, oh, okay, 220 is not bad, though. 220 is not bad. I'm, I guess I'm not really surprised that we don't have a focus yet, but still. Uh, send 100 here. That'd be good. And... We don't have that many plans. Most of these are just on carriers. Actually, I think I've been debating whether we should just get rid of the entire navy. It might just be worth doing that. Maybe, maybe not. So, actually, we're gonna go up to 120 because I want I want a lot of cast. Nice. Just bomb the living crap out of them. Oh, we're here. Nice. Um, you guys should be able to hold here. I'm I'm more worried about the commies to the north. So, but hey, at least we got some of this stuff going. I like this. Don't worry about the economy. Totally not being bad right now. Um, we can't do anything down here. We can do faction relations later on. So we'll definitely do a lot of the poverty stuff here. But my god. Oh, so much. Alright, so. Surge troops of the Philippines. Three Japanese divisions. Begin the bomber offensives. We can now bomb three states at the same time. Oh, that sounds like fun. Bombing campaign in Get Nang Luzon. Hmm. Filipino-Japanese training scheme. Increases. Ooh, their defense. Yeah, let's do that one. Uh, last end of the Pearl of the Orient. Construct mountain constabularies. Ooh. Three more forts. Get in there, boys. We don't want to lose this one. So, oh, and the German Civil War is firing, too. Um, well, that's okay. If we could go right there, that'd be great, actually. We actually might be able to. Yeah, you gotta love it when the Germans explode. Just kind of like our economy. Quite literally, just like our economy. Yeah, it's just going all sorts of kaboom right now. Good job, guys. And so it begins. Actually, if anything, you go right there. That'd be great. You should be able to win this war. I mean, with air superiority. Oh, look at those guys do. Cut these divisions off. The fall of Eno. In the wake of the recent scandals following the uncovering of widespread corruption in the government, an unprecedented political earthquake has shaken the very core of the Japanese Empire. Every newspaper in Japan and the entirety of the sphere is reporting that His Excellency the Prime Minister Ino Horoya has been forced to resign following a vote in confidence in the Imperial Diet, and the news is rapidly spreading around the world, as concerns rise about a possible shockwave of political instability spreading to all of Asia. The position of Ino itself, as Prime Minister, was a result of a tenuous compromise, resulting from an attempt to contain the influence of the Imperial Japanese Army in the civilian government by finding a mediation between the various wings of the Taisei Yoko Sankai. However, such a fragile situation was shattered, and Japan's delicate political equilibrium has been gravely upset. Few commentators dare make predictions about the future in such a volatile situation, but the gears of the Japanese political machine are already starting to set themselves in motion to react to the crisis. Politics is a harsh mistress. Crap. Incident F17238. In a hot and sweaty mines that have fallen to disrepair under the IJ administration in northern Chozon. Dirty faces laborers dug deep into the earth in search of magnesium ores to be used in manufacturing on the home isles or to be packed and shipped across the sphere for other domestic consumption. The clinks and clanks of pickaxes echo throughout the mazes of mine shafts and out of the core in the industrial zone of the northeastern mountains. A group of miners hundreds of meters below the earth's surface had discovered a vein of gold ore while dragging their heavy feet down the claustrophobic mine shaft tunnels and were thrilled with joy at the thought of the riches. Being so far deep underground, any officer or administrator watching over them would be distracted for long enough so that they could smuggle some of the pure gold down their deep pockets or socks. 
They clambered over each other, shoving one another to reach the gold, a shining gold mineral, until one of the poor miners was thrown against a particularly weak metal beam. A great crackling snapped down the mine shaft, and in mere seconds the tunnel began to collapse in on itself, crushing the labors below the earth's surface. A mighty tumble shook the earth that drowned out the screams of those trapped underneath, but the administrators above were left largely confused about the source of the thud, for the positions overwatching the quarry. Buried treasure? A new Prime Minister. Emergency meetings have already begun in the House of Peers and in the House of Representatives to find a replacement for Eno. While Japanese politics are dominated by the Tasai Yoku Sankai, the party itself is bitterly split among numerous rival cliques, each representing different interest groups with different visions for the future of the Empire in the sphere. While the Emperor nominates a Prime Minister, then the Diet has a massive influence over his Majesty's decision, as the Diet can always vote a candidate they don't like out of office. However, most commentators of both foreign and domestic agree that a new PM will soon be chosen, as had occurred when Tojo and Kido were forced to resign in the past. Two major candidates have sprung forth from the ranks of the Taisai, Taisei Yoko Sankai, Kaya Ikonori, and Ikeda Masanuke, uh, Masanosuke. Kaya, formerly a minister of finance, belongs to the faction of the Yoko Sankai termed technocrats, advocating for further centralization and state intervention into the Japanese economy, while at the same time removing the last remnants of the military influence from the government of Japan. The other candidate, Ikeda, comes from the conservative wing of the Yoko Sankai, uh, the one to which former Prime Minister Ino also belonged, a section of the party closer to the army, much less prone to reform. In which I think we're probably going to try to attempt to Kaida. Kaya, in which we've already been still going to kill these guys off here. And actually, what's going on here? What is, what is this? Morale rises. Oh, morale rises, but not complete. Oh, sh Nikes. They actually push through here. That's actually very concerning. But we can still get them. We can still do, win and do well here. Oh, God. Our GDP is actually lower than our actual debt. Oh, my God. It went down and then it just spiked. And then we went up and then it went down. Um, what if we did that? Would that help out growth? But that just spends so much more money. We still have an unlimited debts. What if we did, like, max out everything? Could we actually, like... It's, growth would still be really bad. 16 billion in deficit. Oh my goodness, yeah, I know. We're still going to get the surplus and cut off as much debt as possible. There you go. Good job, guys. Good job. Now getting attack 2 expansion into Africa. Alright. I'll go straight there. Literally go straight there. Force the uprising. Kaya tries to secure backing. In a somewhat confused situation after the fall of Eno, the technocrat faction had been trying to bolster the ranks and wrestle control of the Yoko Sankai. Rallying around Kaya Ikoniori, Okinori, the candidate for PM, their voices are becoming louder and louder in the party to the point where some speculate that their ultimate victory is close at hand. Kaya himself has been releasing more and more bold statements in the interview, with some commenting that he speaks as if he were prime minister already. Some murmuring is rising from the representatives of the conservative wing of the Yoko, Yoko Sankai, and there is fears that the technocrats are attempting to take over the party, however. It seems like Kaya's bid for the position has never been stronger. Could reform be the way to go? Actually... Oh, crap. Opposition is 90. Um, because the faction is less power than the ruling faction, this action is less effective. Oh. Protect publicly. Slander? Oh. Huh. I'll support. Well, we'll see what happens. I mean, our support's going to be just drained and, like crazy. Oh, Hirohito's here. Look at that. For the conservatives. It's public opinion. Yeah. Conservatives power faction. Power. Public approval. Reasons. Nah, eh, whatever. Let's keep defending for now. We got a lot of commies to kill. You guys go actually right there. Don't let the Marines go. Let, let, let the Marines hold. There you go. Get in there if you possibly can. Kai's not very well liked, turns out. In recent days, Kai's attempts to cement his position as candidate for Prime Minister have been frustrated by constant and fierce resistance from the other wings of the Yoko Sankai. It seems that the politically aggressive stance of the technocrats has obtained the opposite effect of their goal, as it alienated the rest of the party and provoked backlash from the conservatives now rallying more and more around Ikeda. Slammed by pro-conservative newspapers, Kai has been forced to moderate his stance and go back on some of his earlier stances, and it seems like the offensive. Well, the technocrats has already been exhausted, with Kai's bid for the position weaker by the day. It appears likely that the new Prime Minister won't be a technocrat. Uh, well, if that's the case, oh, that's not good. Um, is there anything we could do? Oh, come on, I don't care about Austin right now. I really don't care. Interact, publicly attack. Approval goes down, reformers goes down. Oof. What if we were to do this one? Slander? Launch a slander campaign. How support it appears? 64.5. How appears goes up? Oh. Well. Well, whatever. Whatever. I'm probably going to go off screen and, and fix some of the stuff up anyway, so. It doesn't really matter to us too much. And. Yeah. There you go. Deadlock. 
So far, it seems that every attempt to put a new prime minister in office has been met with failure. Political infight in the Taisei Yoko Sankai have prevented the two major candidates, Kaya and Ikeda, from gaining a strong enough base of support, and Kyoto's attempts to nominate the prime minister by going directly through the emperor has been slammed by the diet. A dreaded word is being repeated more and more often by newspapers and TV in its numerous variants, all of the same meaning, political gridlock, impasse, stalemate, and deadlock. These new developments have been accompanied by an aura of pessimism spreading across Japan's government, and the country watches in fear as the unclear political direction might have ill efforts on the economy as well. A solution must be found, and in times like these, the only solution can be compromise of a particular type, the one that leaves all parties unsatisfied. This cannot continue, but it's going to. Okay, they're doing okay down there, which is good. Kido suggests Kogura Bodayu. To resolve the political snag that the Japanese government has found itself resolved into, an old acquaintance from the Japanese politics has stepped into the limelight. Former Prime Minister and Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal, Maruki Kochi, uh, Koichi Kido. A staunch technocrat and Eno's predecessor, Kido has largely remained in the shadows of Japanese politics during the recent years and after being ousted following his aggressive attempts to eliminate IJA influence on the civilian government. Kido stepped forth to the Emperor, proposing the name of Kogura Baduyu. Budayu, as a possible appointment for Ino, a relatively uninfluential member of the Yosukansai, Yokosankai. Budayu has served as a minister in Kido's cabinet. While Kido's influence, strong influence in the Privy Council might mean that Budayu might get nominated as Prime Minister by the Emperor himself, bypassing the Diet, this has already sparked a strong reaction from the sections of the Yokosankai that are more hostile to Kido. Perhaps the Emperor will step in. South African War? We don't really care. Good job. We have our own South African war to deal with right now. We don't. We literally don't care right now. Ooh, continue editing shipments. Uh, search troops. Bomb more states. Hmm. Defenses and shipment speed. Yeah, I like that. I like that one a lot. No vegan is gone. Good. 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 Nice. Oh my god! I press enter and nothing happens. Maybe we can just go up there. That'd be great. 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 And to delete another division. Now it's only a militia division, but that is fine with us. And there we have the Diet threatens no confidence in Kogura. A unified statement has been released by the members of the Diet of the Taisei Yoko Sankai, saying the party will not support the nomination of Budayu as Prime Minister, and says immediately passing a vote of confidence, signifying the end of Budayu's tenure before it even began. Such a bold statement is especially surprising, considering that it might even mean defying the will of the Privy Council, and by extension, the Emperor himself. Some the members of the Privy Council are recalling this a bluff. The Yoko Sankai wants to be left free to play its petty political games, but there's no way they would dare openly attack the Privy Council in such an outrageous way, however. Uh, some are advising caution, if the Imperial Diet is serious, then a vote of no confidence would be a devastating blow to the Privy Council's political authority, potentially discrediting Kido and risking his position as Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal. This puts Kido in front of a quite difficult choice. Should he back down and call the Diet's bluff? It's too risky, my friends. It is too risky. Good job, guys. Honestly, could you just, like... Swarm the capital. Why is it lagging so bad? Oh my god, it's lagging so badly. So we'll see what happens. An insider. The recent snag in which a Japanese government has found itself as a source of embarrassment for the whole nation in the eyes of the Asia and of the whole world. He had negotiations between the Diet and the Privy Council, as well as within the Yoku Sankai itself, so far have gone nowhere. However, another group of politicians have weaseled into the negotiations, the clique of Yoku Sankai closer to former Prime Minister Ino Hiroya. Well, Ino himself was a national conservative, much like his protege Ikeda. He was able to create a stable political equilibrium by compromising with the opposing factions of the Yoku Sankai, especially the technocrats now rallying around Kaya. Eno's involvement in the talks have been kept largely on the quiet side, but it might be the key to solving the mess. A bit ironic, but we've literally just gone ahead and finished off these guys over here. Uh, there was another comment saying that you should almost always, if you can, send helicopter divisions because they're really, really strong, and I completely agree. These transport helicopters still pretty darn nice. Hurts your organization, though, but it does help you out quite a bit here, which I do appreciate. And we're doing relatively okay. And also, I think I looked this up. Is that it's right? Dirigism. Dirigisme. Dirigisme. I'm going to say this wrong no matter what I do, so. Dear Gizm. Dear Gizm. Dear Gizm. Dear Gizm. I'm going to say it wrong no matter what I do. So, it is what it is. A suggestion. Newspaper report that a new option is on the table, likely proposed by Ino Hiroi himself. Uh, Kichi Aichi, a former minister of Ino's cabinet, is well known for his completely equal distance from all the major factions and cliques of the Yoko Sankai. His lack of charisma and commitment to a faction preventing him from initially being considered as a candidate to replace Ino, but in this peculiar situation, Aichi might be the perfect person to fill the political rift that is dividing the Yoko Sankai. The reactions from Kaios and Ikeda's cliques have been lukewarm, but it appears that there might be some, really no other option to get out of the mire. Kido, Koichi, and the Privy Council have also expressed a tentative agreement with Aichi's nomination. 
While nobody's truly satisfied or happy, with every passing day, it seems more and more likely that Aichi will become the new Prime Minister. This is getting really quite exhausting. Not bad. And I'm saying coming down here so we can hopefully beat up a couple more Americans as well, because right now, I can't put a frontline system or put frontline down at all. Uh, yeah, there's no place you can do that, which sucks. I guess I should help out. Oh, Alex Jones! <gasps> Alex Jones is in TNO? Whoa, Mr. No, I'm not going to say anything. I don't want to get hit by YouTube. Nope, not going to say anything. Uh, nothing about a hook. Uh, it being Sandy and... Nope, nope, nope. Uh, trying across an Amnok. The Amnok twinkled in the sunlight as the snowmelt flowed towards the west where <clears throat> it would meet the ocean. In her 33 years of existence, Mi Jia had never seen, been as far north. It had taken months of careful saving and endless nights of singing to get her here, but she would go farther than that. Her eyes scanned the line in front of her, seeing concrete blocks, smokestacks, and scattered apartment buildings. If she squinted, she could barely make out the silhouettes of people. They seemed like ants in a hill. Saw fog obscured her view, or was it pollution? With Manchuria, she couldn't tell. Any voice called out to her. Breaking her moment of contemplation, a distant person wavered, gesturing to the radio station, she, or train station. She ran over. Was the train going to depart? Trains about to depart? Mi Jia took a moment to breathe. Hey, Jia nodded before sprinting to the train station. Mi Jia had no choice but to follow, lest she got stranded forever. An attendant held the door open, nearly smashing Jia's foot when he closed it. In two hours, they'd be in Mukdem, and then there would be no going back. As they walked to their companions, they entered Manchuria. Mi Jia claimed the window seat, where she would watch the farms and factories pass by, idly wondering if they all would have to work in them one day. When brushed by her hair as a woman, Yong Im, if she remembered correctly, opened the window screen. She listened to the chat of her group as they discussed what they would do when they arrived. She thought that she should participate. But they were singers, singers that had uprooted themselves from all they knew. Mija hummed a new tune, taking her mind off of real life as she etched lyrics in her head. Back in the day when the wind blew, we were killing Americans in the Philippines, just like you. Kichi... Achi appointed Prime Minister. After one last round of meetings and negotiations, it seemed like the Imperial Diet has found a way to found a way out of the political dead end. Kichi Aichi has been chosen by the Emperor to fulfill the position of Prime Minister with the near unanimous support from the Tsai Taitsei Yoko Sankai, with the various wings of the party that have bitterly fought until recently till now at last. Or at least un they're united at last. Newspapers across Japan and the sphere celebrate this development as a testament to Yoku Sankai. Representing the will of the nation, overcoming petty factionalism and political infighting, a cautious, tentative optimism is spreading across Japan, but for those in the upper echelons of the Yoku Sankai, this is no time for celebration, let alone for relaxing. I'm sure Aichi will do a fine job. Isn't that... Hmm. Kichi, huh? Alright. And he's a fascist. Yoku Sankai, despotist, authoritarian democracy... So, yeah, we'll see what happens. So, he is. None of these guys. And this guy is what? He looks different. Well, look, we'll see how, how, how long this guy lasts here. But, let's see. Conflict status. Uh, troop surge. Do we really need a troop surge? I mean, we're doing relatively okay as well, so. Oh, the guy's actually. Oh. Is there another way through here? Maybe not. No, oh, yeah, there is. There definitely is. Oh, that's not bad. Uh, Philippine training scheme. We could have three more divisions if we really wanted to, but I don't want to. Train debuffs? Why not? Screw it. We'll do that. And we're still... Key to white relations are good, huh? Let's see. What else do we want to do here? We're going to lower our support. By how much? 2.5%? Growth? Poverty. We get a slightly worsen. Ooh. Oh, boy. Income tax. Poverty begin to improve. 35 political power. Anything down here? Poverty begin to improve in Hokkaido. Mm, poverty begin to be improve with minimal wage reform. So basically, you get 0 0.05 more GDP growth. Yeah, why not? Sounds good to us. Can we actually have a front line? Yeah, oh, yes, thank you. Let's see if we can just go right on in. Or just. Just literally go straight on in. Nishi ta ta Takechi? Takechi? Doing a pretty nice job, not gonna lie. Uh oh, they got stuff there. Interregnum, though. Just a few days into the Aichi's tenure as Prime Minister, the vague air of optimism that has spread in Japan is dissolved in the wind. The process of forming a cabinet caused endless bickering in the Taisei Yoko Sankai, ending up with a patchwork cabinet made up of ministers from several different cliques that barely wish to speak to each other. What's worse, it seems that murmurs have arisen from multiple factions of the party, plus the overthrow of the Aichi's government. And the Imperial Diet, the Privy Council, the Taisei Yoko Sankai, or all a pack of wolves turning on each other after being left out without a leader. While a facade of unity and optimism is paraded on newspapers and public appearances, and while ostensibly the party stands united behind Aichi, the truth is far different. The real struggle for the power in the Japanese government is only starting, and no one knows how it'll end. The interregnum has truly begun. Interregnum? Not bad. 
And let's see. Let's slow down just a little bit more to enjoy the battle between us and some APCs. Uh, not bad. I love it. Oh, we can pierce arm, en enemy armor? National polity. It can be difficult to distinguish between truth and rumors and the whispers echoing throughout the diet, but many deputies do have a knack for telling when conflict is brewing behind the scene. As the lame duck prime minister watches impotently, the Yakuzan Kai main factions sharpen knives and try to figure out the best angle of attack on their enemies. Chief among them are the technocrats. Their leader Kai has not given up on his dream of imposing a new order on Japan's economy, with or without political support. Independent deputies weigh the possible benefits from supporting him, but the dangers of making an enemy of Ikeda and this conservative bloc. Independent deputies that have freed themselves of factional shackles are being dragged against their will back into the Yoko Sankai Civil War. The stance between both sides is complicated by the emergence of a third power block. The indefatigable Takagi has struggled for quite some time now to establish a third path between the conservative stagnation and the technocrat's dangerous intertwining of government and industry. A small but growing reformist faction enthusiastically supports the former Navy officer's program by untangling the economy from Japan's political and military elites. The corruption and instability of the Yoko Sankai can be brought to an end. Once a dormant part of the conservative coalition, the reformist faction has been given a shot in the arm by the failures of both conservatives and technocrats to grab the Prime Minister's office. Smelling blood in the water, the reformists have begun dreaming with renewed vigor. Throughout all this, rumors that former Prime Minister Kido Koichihas Koichi has not yet given up his radical agenda, while the majority of the technocrats support Kaya publicly. The perspective of a transformed Yoko Sankai remains a very appealing one. The fusion of total political and economical control with army backing remains an intoxicating idea amongst the chamber's most ambitious. Now the rumor's gone, all, or goes, all sides are preparing their moves. It seems the interregnum ceasefire is ending. Gentlemen, show your cards, please. Thank you very much. We do have five more army XP. The marines need to be a little bit better, because they're not looking too hot right now, but these planes are looking not too bad. Um, actually, um, armor battle groups, nothing here, and mobile, mm, yeah, there's nothing for planes and Honestly, I don't mind making the marines a little thicker. They send combo with at the very least. Slightly costly, but that's okay. Well, if you want to, you guys can probably move in here pretty quickly. Takagi's Gambit. The inclusion of the Japanese reformers into the Yoko Sankai came out of the darkest days of the war, where united in front of all Japanese politicians seems indispensable. Victory did not bring liberalization of the economy, but an ever-increasing bubble of economic development for the greatest Japanese conglomerates. Vast quantities of contracts with the government and the army brought endless resources to feed corrupt businessmen. The reformists, once swept aside by a tidal wave of money and collusion, were thought to be absorbed into the Yoko Sankai's conservative faction, the very idea of opposing the army, and the conglomerates looked impossible in the new Japan, but now, under the capable leadership of Takagi Tsukichi, the reformists have awoken. Their goal of securing the prime ministership looks like a pipe dream. The reformists command new members of the Yoko Sankai, and already against them is the full might of Japan's economic establishment as well as the leaders of its army. And so Takagi prepares an ambitious gambit. With a little help from this native context, the technocrats ties to the army can be exploited for political gains. On the other hand, many reformists stubbornly cling to Eno's conservative coalition, one attempt to peel off as many reformists as possible from the dying conservative faction. Both paths are fraught with risk, but desperate times require hard decisions. Takagi and Kai will face each other. Finish off the conservatives. Um, which one do we want to do? Hmm. Finish off the conservatives. Hit the army hard. <clears throat> Contacts in the navy. Motion of sentry against these guys. What do you mean by confront? Like, okay, so I saved. We'll see what happens. These guys love attacking us. Can the marines? They cannot pierce them, right? Yeah, they can't pierce them, which sucks. The Marines are not very strong right now. It sucks. Motion is centered against Eno. We have a good amount of anti-air, or at least damage. Every day that the die is in session, the former Prime Minister Eno and his associates duly take their seat in the National Assembly. Ever since the collapse of the Eno Premiership, these relics of a previous era have been mercilessly let to rot in obscurity as the chambers moved on to new, better disputes. Takagi and his associates now I believe it is time to revisit the disastrous Eno era to drag the conservatives through the mud some more. By bringing a motion forward of censure in the chamber against Eno, Takagi helps to dig in more holes into the conservative sinking ship before Ikeda manage manages to write it. Passing such a motion is going to be a tall order. The tiny reformist faction will need to convince the remaining reformists within the conservative faction to join. Support from independents and technocrats will also be important. All the conservatives need to do is smoke a few holes or points of this loose coalition to make it break down. But the reformist dream is finally tearing up the old conservative faction and scoop up as many reformist sympathizers as possible, and so Takagi's gamut begins. May weaken Ikeda, bribes and threats. Takagi. May weaken Ikeda. May weaken Takagi. Well. 
Well, this Takagi's there. Kido. You. The conservative faction, of course. And Kaya. Hmm. Wait. Takagi's over here. Ikeda. Is this Ikeda? Oh, crap. Um, well, they're formists. Uh, may weaken uh, Takagi. Bribes and threats. Bribes and threats. May weaken him. Mm, bribes and threats. One. One. We'll see what happens. Oh, what was that? Not sure. I would love to attack here, but we're going to wait. Bribes and threats. Carrots and sticks. It's the way the Yoko Sunkai has always done things. Whisper sweet nothings into one ear and pull the other. So it is with the Ino clique, now staunch Ikeda supporters, and with ties to the establishment and their speeches and their checkbooks. The old way has proven approved one more persuasive than its alternatives. And when persuasion fails, well, this attitude does not translate so well to the rest of the diet, whom the Ikeda clique quickly sets out to recruit by means of what can only be described as throwing their financial weight around. It can't be corruption if it's necessary for the preservation of the nation, after all. Turns out the diet. That's all patience for the yes man who watched the leader tie the government to the hated Army Navy complex. Over the next month, 237 letters were received by various members associating themselves with Ikeda's agenda, comparing them to traitors, militarists, and double Western double agents. Kaya and Takagi even take a breather from the internecine, internecine strife to present a united front against Ikeda's antics. Representatives from both cliques lambast the Ino worshippers. As they're coming to be known, it's fair to delude themselves into thinking the old methods are somehow going to save Japan by repeating its mistakes. Ikeda's men are angry. The old guard, Ino, I see the opportunity. And the tongues of flame begin to lick at Ikeda's bid for power, before it's even begun. Those fools. Yeah, this is going to be a problem trying to break into here, isn't it? Yeah, this is definitely going to be a big old problem. The die brawls. Power struggles, or power invites jealousy. Jealousy invites scheming. Scheming invites struggle. Ikeda must contend with the rest of the establishment he is attempting to co-opt. But his rivals in the Inuit Ogar have other plans for him. A plan is drafted in the dead of night. And a host of accusations against Ikeda's level. That his ties to the Japanese army and navy cultivated over connections through the Inuits are no coincidence. That he is really just a mouthpiece for a new form of military control leveled over the helpless dying country. That he intends to purge the Kai and Takagi cliques from power dominate the Yokusankai. Uh, Yoku for the old order was purged through fear and rumors and Skano surely intends to restore by force what has been lost. The speech is given first thing in the morning and already chill atmosphere in that diet quickly turns fiery. The speech does not go down well, to say the least. You know why it's accused appears in each other betrayal. The Kai and Takagi cleats pot shots, token pot shots at each other, and chaos reigns within the Tai confines of the Dai's reserve power structures. Representative turned against representative, as a particularly violent session of the criticism of the Ino regime turns into an irregular fistfight between politicians. The nation's cameras and press capture the image of a helpless Ikeda watching his clique turn into a glorified Yakuza chapter, and Ikeda watches his dreams of restoring some sense of order to Japanese politics burn to the ground. Situations develop, and not necessarily to our advantage. Unrest in the Hawaiian Islands. J uh, jails in Honolulu have been overflowing this past week with the arrest of several anti Japanese terrorist cells on the island. Since uh, the beginning of its fraternity with the home islands in 46, integrating Hawaii into the great Japanese realm has always been a challenge, only intensified in recent years. This latest batch of attacks seems to have split into two camps, namely American nationalist and native Hawaiian resistance. Both groups have attacked. Military and police installations disrupting navy, naval supply lines and harassing Japanese citizens on the islands, thankfully. They've all been apprehended and turned in for questioning, interestingly. The American safe houses had several articles of wartime propaganda and blueprints for American rifles. The Camp Itai will be pursuing this further. Those can never stay still, can they? An unpleasant finding. Yasuda Banking, Yasuda Fire Insurance, Yasuda Investments, Yasuda in Innovation and Enterprises. The Yasuda Leviathan slouches like a beast over corporate Japan and now leaves a long, oily shadow. The group's core of property in downtown Tokyo is a swirling mass of endless hallways and bureaucrats, many belonging to the other big four firms, whispered as though they are foreign countries, and the government. And the halls are, are full of chatter this week as investigation has captured the minds of the company just as it has captured the news presses. Asato Kokai has a recent arrival fresh from the university, and he believes he stumbled onto something very big, very big indeed. Errors have begun to proliferate on the balance sheet of Yasuda Bank, which is worrying especially since he's in a junior role in the bank's accounting division, but what is more perplexing uh, <clears throat> are still are the obvious sources of errors, a series of large anonymous numbers attributable to the Minazaka group. The company's been all over the press recently and for the wrong reasons, and yet no one will tell him why the company under investigation has paid sums of money to Yasuda and for no discernible reason at all. Then he scheduled a meeting with his boss in hopes of arranging some assistance and perhaps getting a promotion out of the matter after all. As a matter of profit, and profit is Yasuda's bread and butter. The boss even takes time out of his schedule to meet with him personally, which is rare. The reason the boss is so willing to meet with him becomes clear when the boss slips him an envelope with an apologetic look the same evening. It reads, fired from proper levels of enthusiasm. Oh boy. Anything else here? Um, oh. 
Kai's position is firm. Ikeda's position is firm. Nobody's in the favor to succeed as prime minister. Cool. Uh, search troops. We're going to need more soldiers. Ikeda's dilemma. Uh, I want to read about the new pickle image first. Uh, Dong Wai has spent his year, past year in the hills around the Yalu River, patrolling with a small band of liberators for the corrupt Japanese who had run his country like a plantation. The NAJUA was splintered across the wide plains of Manchuria and the few cells hidden deep in the Koreas, the remaining forests and villages. Radio messages took a hold of a mid-level Japanese officer residing near the Paktu Mountain. As one of Korea's greatest symbols, the rebel felt the death of his foes at his base would be a fitting end for another cog in the machine that raped the lands belonging to him and every other Korean in subjugation. Peering out from an outcrop, he saw a long line of cars near the mountains. Sir, they don't look like IJA trucks to me, one man spoke up. Dong Wee snatched the binoculars and looked at the men getting out. Not just men, families! Following the trail was a sign written in Korean and Japanese, Welcome to Heaven's Lake, Campgrounds and Cottages. His face began to redden the more he looked. Cheap rubbish bins scattered about, tacky homes by the sacred lake, and smoke from various points, campfires. A sanctified place turned not even into a museum, but a tourist locale. He began to weep, his spare hand reaching for the old pistol he kept by his side, the grooves familiar to his touch. He just dedicated his life against the Japanese, and they had become so secure they vacationed in his country. But he could only watch as Pektu, the spiritual home of Korea, became yet another spot for the oppressor to make money. Truly nothing is sacred. Ikeda's dilemma. Ikeda Masanosuke. Masanosuke. As a man of few words, and is even fewer to spare for fools. A uh, career in journalism taught him the value of concise prose and yo. Kusankai well. Perhaps this is why the unseen unfolding before him is so deeply discom discomforting or discomfitting on a personal level. After all, a man who suffers not the foolish is fundamentally disinclined to have his colleagues put on village idiot kabuki masks and dance around each other, howling all the while. Not that he has anything against kabuki dances, low brows they might be. Day and night the diet churns with intrigue as his fear burns and his people plot. Is this how Eno saw his nation going as he handed in his resignation letter? He ponders the path ahead. Clean and symmetrical, like the katakana classes he used to do in his youth. He never liked those classes. The world was easier to handle than the infinite fall of a radical stroke. Some of those men in the Yoko Sankai were close to Ino, barely avoiding being dragged down with him. They might turn to Ikeda if he still plays his card rights. A speech in the diet persuading those who still believe in the old ways of old things, or what the Chinese would call Wu Wei, to stand firm might just throw him into the spotlight and into a position where he can begin to fix things. On the other hand, Ino's clique has had badly been compromised. Been badly compromised. By the scandal, it might be better to start over, to form a new party entirely, and the reformers who aren't looking to Takagi have shown a somewhat con conciliatory hand. Ikeda thinks for long days and longer nights. Uh, then he begins to act. Ikeda. Takagi and Ikeda will confront each other. Takagi. Fresh barrels, fresh sake, appeal to the reformists. We'll do that one, why not? And if this goes poorly, then I'm just going to do some funky stuff off screen. They really want to kill us, don't they? Why? What have we done to them? The canal riots. Cool. How many more days? 15 days, 2 weeks? Not bad. Yeah, uh, I don't think we can actually push it here, can we? Yeah, no, not even with all that air, extra airspeed already. Ooh, actually, they were doing okay. Sure, support. The representative's face is ne neon red as he takes a podium to invite the next speaker to the state. It's a quiet club down in Tokyo, a solidly, solidly established institution of the flowing world, and the remnants of the Yokosun Kai loyalists are gathered here to drink, talk shop, and forget about their political troubles. Not talking about something doesn't make it go away, of course, but to mention that would be in the, itself a faux pas, and so it's left untouched. This is Japanese politics, to artfully dodge questions when they are posed, to maintain respect for authority by remaining submissive to its abuses, like all norms it is widely adhered to, and, it means that, and that means it can be manipulated. It can't take the stage to start to speak. He calls on the audience to remember the days of Ino. Stability was messy and founded on complicity, but it was stable, and it was better than the present chaos. He outlines in some details his own plan, by working with the army, never collaborating, or God forbid submitting, and consolidating the diet. It might be possible to weave a whole cloth from the desperate threads of the faction, and he pauses. Here his speech diverges. Two separate threads unraveled from the same fabric. He can offer the usual generous concessions as a means of securing loyalty, but likely, Ikeda has dreamt bigger dreams than mere loyalty. He has drafted a plan for true reform of the Japanese diet clique's party system. One that will ensure the brokenness of the old system will never be repeated, but but money shouts through principles whisper. What shown shall be? Money or reform? Well, his pet threatened. I want Ikeda to be threatened, too. May weaken Takagi. Let's see. Yeah, just attacking all Billy Neely. Look at that. It's a bad idea. Bribes and threats. Um, I've already read this one. It looks like I've read this one before. Those fools. If you want to read this one again, please go ahead. Kata's position is firm still, huh? PL PFLP, huh? Cool. 
These divisions are just not strong enough right now. Oh, but we did get supply and chain reinforcement, which is nice. We're going to done here, too. Good. Let them attack us. Die brawl. Um, did I read this one before as well? I think it has. Yeah, I have. If you read this again, please go ahead. Now, Katie's position has been weakened. Tenuous and tenuous. Kaya's position is firm. Oh, boy. What happened to those two divisions? Kaya's plot. The disgrace of former Prime Minister Kido could have spelled the end of the technocrat faction, but the goal of strengthening Japan's civilian government remains a tantalizing one. Technocrat's search for a new leader was Kaya. Okinori's big break, a bureaucrat with army connections, Kaya's strength both within the died and throughout the Japanese government has made him one of the only ten serious contenders for true power. A few political observers are shocked by the about face of the Japanese army concerning the technocrat clique. But since the 50s, with the army situation in this sphere has continually been degrading. With pandemonium breaking out all throughout East Asia and the downfall of the Ino government, the army has found itself shopping for new alliances. In the Kaya Okinori, the military brass has found a very willing partner. The bureaucrats need to bypass the dad has resulted in him making very nice concessions to the army interests. He is thus now seen as a favorable alternative to the army's beloved conservatives, now Kaya. Plots against the conservative faction and the resurgent reformist bloc. Both factions detest the technocrat program and so they must be crushed if Kaya's program is to go forward. Using friends within the diet and without, Kaya is on the verge of declaring open warfare against his enemies. Time to move out into the open. Yeah, technically he's suicidal. The cracks widen. So, your first day tracking the flow. Flow is what we call it here at the Madhouse. Uh, Ryu, what was your name? Ah, it won't matter. Soon enough, haha, <laughs> we'll give all our employees nicknames after the first week. Oh, hi, Sumito. We'll call him the snoring cat because in his he, in his office, well, he snores and lies on the desk. You'd <clears throat> better hope we don't give you a similar nickname. You're not protected like Sumito is. Anyway, the flow. Is that right? We're in charge of accountants for special and general accounts. The two main accounts for the war ministry and our job is simple. See the spreadsheet? There's a flow and it works like this. Other firms spend money on bonds which are bought from the general accountant. The revenue from this channel is channeled to the special account, because the special account handles all of our transactions with the Army Navy. They funnel it through a firm you might have heard of called the Minazaka Group. So the money goes from the firms to the general account, to the special account, then to Minazaka and the armed forces, so the Army Navy can play games with the guns and ships. Complicated, but it's like water flowing through pools at the Zen Garden. Flow, see? Okay, wait, so you see the numbers here? That indicates that this stream is jammed up. You see what I think? Darn, wait, this stream is jammed up too, and... This, that, this one, that one, what's going on? Half the flows jammed up these numbers alone, and this is just the past week. Uh, Mitsue Matsu, Matsuzaka, I want an emergency meeting in 15 minutes. Uh, if I don't get an answer, so go help me. Gods, Ryu will be getting new friends very, very soon. Wait, what the heck is Minazaka doing? Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh. Oh no. It's still going down. But that is but a number, just like age? Hmm. Ryle to die. But like any good back blacksmith, Kaya knew that the rising temperature of the material makes it more pliable. By exploding the diet's anger, the Inu government collapsed. He hopes to humiliate the conservatives responsible for this mess or discredit the reformist solutions. His next move could thus go down in two directions. Using his claw within the diet, he could raise chaos about the corruption of the Inu Arab to try and embarrass the conservative act faction led by Ikeda. Then again, the members of the diet are not as reliable as they used to be, and if the plan failed, to make a fool out of Kaya's ambitions. The other way forward might to make some calls to the army context. As an institution normally outside the political chaos, the army could bring uh, forward recommendations on the best way forward. Moving faster than the reformers and their navy sponsors could be a source of prestige or enrage a navy into making suggestions of their own. Such an outcome could stall Kai's attempt to outmaneuver his opponents. The time being of the essence, the only axis of attack could be chosen. After giving some thought, Kai decides. Um, Takagi and Kaya. I mean, well, I'm just looking over here. Not over here. Uh, get over here. We need the GUI. So, 133. We're at 93. It's not bad. Everyone's bigger than us, except for the Ketoites, which does kind of suck, but it is what it is. Independence, too. Hmm. Make me some more soldiers. Uh, surge troops? Yeah? That doesn't make any sense. Can we bomb more than three states at a time? We need more command power now. That's true, we should, we should have been doing this stuff, too, but whatever. Ikeda, Takagi. Oh, I'm gonna call it the army. Oh, Suzuki's gone. Uh oh. Well, that's not good. Greed over loyalty. You best not lose, son. Securing army backing. Officially, the Honorable Imperial Army does not have any political interest beyond advising on who the war minister should be. In practice, however, the mess of the army suppliers, companies directed by former officers and colonial industrial interests overseen by military men, has granted the army some of the months of gravitas in political affairs. 
The recent implosion of the Eno cabinet due to a massive corruption scandal has left the Jones unusually reserved about political comments. Perhaps the consensus on the army side commands is to wait to see which faction is likely to emerge as a bis business partner. This official neutrality is not extended to Kagi's performance. The idea of seeing the political sphere slip into the hands of the Navy is not one the army enjoys. Why not attempt to strike first and demonstrate that the army is a responsible adult in the room? By bribing or bringing forward an elegantly designed political proposal, the officially neutral army can help strengthen Kai's cause. If the Navy does not respond in time, the Republicans and the Reformist factions are liable to lose feathers. If the Navy does respond, however, Kai's army context will not make much of a splash in the diet. Despite the risks, Kai and his technocrats have arranged for a policy proposal arranged by army leaders to be read in front of the assembly. All in all, wait to the Navy's response. The Navy does not comment on the proposal. Tenuous, tenuous, good. Oh, another one here. Yay! Mm. Poverty will get it worse than new. 0.25, that's not bad. Could use it though. Probably get to improve. Increase income taxes. Growth will increase. There you go. Woo, baby. Not good. Still have a surplus, which I do like, but still. Army scrutiny. The Navy has shown some common sense for once, then left the dice floor to the Army counterparts. Takagi and his reformist cronies grind their teeth as his advisory white paper from the Army is read out to the members of the diet, of course. The Army regrets any corruption that might have occurred in the military procurement contracts after an internal review. The military's colonial administrators have decided that a nonpartisan effort to work with Yokosankai members to create a better partnership with Japan, between Japan civilian and military officials. Some back and forth in negotiation on the bill continued into late in the night. The Yokosankai's various factions all discuss the Army's report and its implications. It remains to be seen if the reformist faction can attempt to block the army's recommendation, but so far it's been smooth sailing for the technocrats. The army's impartiality is to be praised, my friends. Firm. I like them firm. Uh, no comment, but firm is nice. Just make sure you don't lose. Or at least lose too much. Any upgrades here? Ayabe? No? Okay. Alright, so 125... 151. Recommendation from the High Command. It's a rare event. In these days of political chaos, I see the dot working with something approximately efficient. See? Uh, but the Army's recommendations are slowly being transformed into new laws. The Navy's refusal to comment on the issues has weakened the reformist faction, and no independents dared opposing the Yokosankai majority on the issue. The great winners of the outcome are, of course, Kaya's technocrats. Their ability to act as messengers for the Army interests has demonstrated their skill at negotiation. The Army's willingness to self regulate and cooperate with the dot has weakened reformist arguments that the current system is impossible to repair. The technocrats' goal of a strengthened civilian government seems more and more real realizable by the day. We're all working to strengthen Japan. Wait. Kaya's position's been weakened. Threatened, firm, and firm. What? Whatever. It is what it is. C'est la vie. Please stop attacking, for the love of God. Please stop attacking when you have no armor. Piercing stuff. Ooh! Minazaka breaks. News broadcast surrounding the Minazaka affair. A sudden and unanticipated affair, Minazaka's board manager says, after the collapse of its senior leadership, the firm has now publicly asked for a bailout from the government, signing its vital relationship to... Hayato, why are we seeing a firm known throughout Tokyo Collapse? Stock buyouts, mass panic sack. I know a guy who came all the way from Sapporo just to get fired his first week. Just goes to show how management truly isn't worth a picture of warm... Investigation team manager declined to speak on the issue, saying only to leave the matter in the hands of the police. No comment was issued by the latter, but officers have reportedly started bringing weapons home in fear of mob violence by disaffected employees. My whole life I spent building the beast up from the bottom. Minazaka kid wasn't smart, and he was a bit of a prick, but his firm was something I cared about. Now he's gone, where will I go? I don't know what to do. The main question news agencies all over the sphere are asking is, what's next? Especially in light of the recent allegations uh, that the Minazaka was just the tip of the iceberg. <clears throat> And why are government bonds collapsing in value in response to a relatively minor industri industry player? Wait, government bonds collapsing? Are they on, on this too? Oh, oh crap. Oh man, the consolidation. While the political rumblings within the Yokosun Kai show no sign of ceasing, it's clear that something has changed when the Prime Minister Aichi began his tenure. Well, look embarrassingly like a brawl, with constant shifting and double crossing and general confusion among the ranks of the Taisei Yokosun Kai. It's turned into something more reasonable, resembling a traditional battle. Lines have been drawn, and clear factions have formed, and some have already left the playing field. And the Red Regnum has entered its final stage, while the outcome of the complex political gauntlet is nearly impossible to predict. Most observers, both Japanese and foreign, agree that Aichi's mandate won't last much longer. Trusting the Buddha, good and bad, I bid farewell to the departing year. Too bad it's February. But, oh, we can't even pierce them. Oh, yeah, we can. This division can. Yeah. Oh, they're shooting down aircraft, too. We're the only ones that can't pierce them, so. Yeah, it's good to uh, send the helicopter divisions in here. Takagi knocked out. 
Facing fierce opposition from the armed forces as well as the political establishment of the Taisei Yokosankai, Admiral Sokichi Takagi was always an underdog. Thus, newspapers and commentators have reacted with a little surprise when in an interview, and in bitter, Takagi announced his complete retirement from politics. Apparently, the old Admiral moved back in his native home of Kyushu, far away from the centers of uh, power in Tokyo. Of course, this comes as a major political victory for both Kaya and Ikeda, each releasing a statement of congratulating Takagi for his long and honorable military and political career in service of Japan and the Emperor. However, it's clear that both the national conservatives and the technocrats will descend upon the remnants of Takagi's faction and in inevitably. One of the two will dominate the Yoko Sankai. It seems like the Admiral was sunk. So I apologize if you want us to go down that uh, that route for this campaign. It just it didn't happen this time. <clears throat> Maybe next time. Maybe. We'll see. Training scheme. Even more. How about... How about, how about give me, does that just give me more buffs? Uh, That's not bad. Uh, what's over here? The fraudulent sovereignty? Holy crap, that's really bad. A paradoxical government? Oh boy. I gotta get more growth though. And a list of spirits. Oh wow. Max entrenchment is really bad. Division defense minus 70%. Jesus Christ. It's almost as bad as this. Not quite though. The death knell of reformism. Reformistism. As predicted, a small and hopeful faction formerly spearheaded by Takagi is all like snow under the sun. With the majority of them flocking to Ikeda, and a few joining Kai's ranks, it's rather evident that the foreseeable political future of Japan has no liberalism in sight. As one major faction falls, the other two arise to try and take down the la their last rival. The rhetoric from the National Conservatives and the Technocrats have been rising, with political confrontation escalating more and more. An all-out battle started for political domination within the Yoko Senkai. As Prime Minister Aichi can only stand and watch in silence, Kaya booms that Ikeda and his men are still the same gang of cronies that led Japan to stagnation and corruption in Ino's times. Ikeda answers that Kaya and his associates are a clique of wannabe dictators and traitors to the Kokutai, while rebuking, rebuking the accusations of corruption. The stage is set for the final act of the Interregnum. The diet is too small for the two of them. Just like this stupid island chain here. Oh my gosh. It's literally suicide to try to attack. Um, as long as we're defending, as long as the helicopter's defending, we'll be okay. Ikeda is our defense. And the Imperial die. Kai has assaults against Ikeda and the National Conservative Faction of the Yoko Sankai show no, no sign of dying down. On the contrary, they're mounting. <clears throat> From newspapers, TVs, and radios, Kai and his clique use every opportunity to bless Ikeda, and the accusations of corruption are becoming more and more direct. While Ikeda's Masanosuke has been shrouded in aloof quietness, not responding directly to the noise coming from Kai, the situation is becoming dire. Ikeda must respond to the accusations or succumb to Kai's offensive. The most obvious way for Ikeda to rebuke Kai will be a direct appeal to His Excellency, the Prime Minister Ki uh, Kichi Aichai, Aichi, and the name of the greater good of Japan and of unity within the Yoko Sankai. Aichi can be asked to take a stand against Kaya's uh, <coughs> slanderous accusations against members of his own party. This would be force the technocrats into silence at least for a while. Then there's another option, however. Rumors and whispers of something not quite clean going on between Kaya himself and some prominent Zaibatsus. It'd be risky, but if Ikeda were to expose proof of Kaya's illicit activities to the eyes of Japan, it would mean knocking him and his clique out of the politics for good. After careful consideration, Ikeda decides his next move. Appeal to the Prime Minister. The incorruptible Kaya falls. Ooh. Untenable. It's tenuous. Corporate espionage. The incorruptible Kaya falls. Ooh. It'd be risky. Ooh. After for good, though. Appeal to the Prime Minister? I want to appeal to the Prime Minister, because I don't want... That, that event sounds really bad for us. His position will be strengthened. What does it mean Kaya is unredeemable, though? Right? So... Uh, we'll go with that one. Corporate espionage. Do the top one. It's firm. Doesn't mean we're over it yet, though. We're not done yet. Not quite. As a stupid war just keeps raging on devastating clarity. How do I have attached some readings I would have been afraid to even take out of the office some, a month before? Now that half dozen firms are under investigation, I think it doesn't matter anymore. My boss, Hiromi, is a strong man, good to his children, and his wife was found with a glass of industrial bleach in his hand yesterday. Ha! The best beverage. The truth is simple. Yasuda. Well, oh, that was me in my chair. My work. Everything has been found out. I hope the nausea of working in a rotten bank would keep the workplace, but now it is out, you should know too. Our funneling money to the army and navy so they can play games with billions of yen. Our payments from Minazaka to keep us quiet while they rolled in the mud. And the ugly shadow of the Kokosai over everything. Everyone knows now. And the bonds which keep Yasuda afloat have burned to ashes. I want to tell you, uh, I want you to tell my son this. I have always loved him. I will 
always. I am so sorry I can barely breathe as I write this, these letters. I hope he will think of me as a man who did done his duty to his family, not as a rotten shadow I truly was. Perhaps he will grow up better. And how, Rook, I want you to know. I think I am in love with you. You have never heard it, have you? Not from my own lips, but when I see you rushing about the kitchen or the teaching hero, I'm convinced that I could walk to, from one end of the empire to the other and I would still be drawn back to you. I love you, Haruka, and what I do, I do to keep you safe. I hope you are remarried, for no man could be fortunate enough to find a wife like you on his own. My secretary will deliver this message. Encloses half a million yen for my funeral costs. I apologize for the rope burns on my neck. My eternal love, Kenji Suzumara. Hey man, it is what it is, incorporating espionage. Every political theater thriller has to start with some espionage, and Ikeda's attempts to input implicate Kaya and corruption are no different. Silently, slowly, private investigators are in contact with thin important Zaibatsus are being mobilized by the dozens of it while Ikeda bids for this time. Something has already been brought back to Ikeda's table. Pieces of tentative evidence. Some suspicious bank accounts. Meetings between men close to Kaya and the finance uh, representatives, however. It's not nearly enough to make a fun move against Kaya. A more direct approach might be needed. Ikeda, with his closest advisors, has decided that an attempt shall be made to contact a member of Kaya's inner clique in the hopes of, to make him give us a proof we need to destroy Kaya. Finding someone willing to do... To work with Kaya or Ikeda won't be easy, but after all, money opens every door. Money is all that lubricates the gears of politics. Please keep attacking. Or us. Yeah. I don't want, the, I don't want our guys to keep attacking these guys, but still. 47,000 manpower. Uh, they probably need more. Yeah, they need more guns. Oh my gosh. The Manchurian candidate. Backroom talks. Treaty meetings. Suitcases full of money being passed from one hand to another. These might not be the most noble weapons in a politician's arsenal, but certainly work enough to allow Ikeda to have his prize. One of the members of Kai's clique and old bureaucrat nearing retirement has accepted Ikeda's offers, and soon enough a large package of documents found their way to Ikeda's desk, and several things beyond Ikeda's wildest dreams. Bank transactions, records of phone calls, photographs of meetings, a mountain of darning evidence, and Ikeda sitting right on top of it. The interregnum is about to end. Uh, well, maybe I should have not done this route. I should have chosen another one, maybe. Because I do want Kaya. I do want Kaya for, at this point. And he's on leak. Oh, this is the end of Kaya's career. So if you don't read about this one, please go right ahead. Um, yeah, I'm going to be back and see if we can change it up just a little bit. The incorruptible Kaya falls. Since Kaya's arrest, things have changed in the Taisei Yoko Sankai. Numerous technocrats have been arrested, the reformists are disembodied, and the national conservatives have become more powerful than they ever were. Thus, little surprise was generated when the newspapers reported that His Majesty the Emperor decided to retire His Excellency Kichi Aichai to entrust His Excellency uh, uh, Ikeda Manosunosuke. Masanosuke, with a position of Prime Minister, without a doubt. This choice is a direct outcome of Ikeda leveraging his newfound domination or the Yoko Sankai into the Diet to strong arm the Emperor. In his inaugural speech, Ikeda decried the corruption of the Ino era, but much more to the so the new and even more insidious illicit trafficking done by Kai and the dirty clique of bureaucrats. Ikeda has promised a national renewal, upholding the Kokutai, preserving peace and stability, and most of all promising an end to corruption. Japan has lost its way, now with the blessing of the immortal Emperor and the guidance of Prime Minister Ikeda Mas Masanosuke, the nation looks ahead to a brighter future once more. Seek not the path of the ancients, seek that which the ancients saw. Huh. Devastating clarity. How do, uh, I've already, I just read this one before we fade and paid out, so if you want to do this again, please go ahead. But there it is. Maximizing growth, of course. As we are looking at, n not goodness, political promotions. Another development has rocked the already divided Japanese political landscape. Following an investigation of the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department, some prominent bureaucrats and politicians associated with Eno's cabinet have been arrested with corruption charges. They are accused of exchanging favors, such as promotions to prominent positions in government in exchange for money and have been involved in numerous embezzlement cases. While there is no hard proof that Ikeda or any members of the Yoko Sankai closest to him can be linked to these newly arrested politicians, but many suspicions are currently afoot. Ikeda has publicly condemned and decried these instances of corruption, but the situation has become tense once more, with Kaya and his men looking for an opening that can finally use to strike Ikeda. The tiger is silent prepares a leap. Hmm. Why would that hurt her growth? I don't want her growth. Up to 3% total reduction, but that's going to hurt. Um, but, but this is giving us 1% more growth. If we do that, we'll have negative nominal GDP growth. The powers that be. And the great secrecy. A conference was organized between Kaya, other members of the Taisei Yoko Sankai, and some representatives of the Imperial Japanese Army in an unassuming hotel in Tokyo. These men of the Japanese Empire met under a single common desire, ending the corruption that has tarnished the Japanese government since the Ino era. The enemy was clear, and they have him in their sights. Ikeda Masanosuke, 
As hands are shaken and alliances are reforged, Kai's would begin to solidify a larger technocrat front opposing Kane and his men, including numerous politicians from different cliques of the Yokosan Kai, as well as several important names of the armed forces. It's only a matter of time before Kaya Okonori, Okonori finally makes his bed for premiership, moving Ikeda from politics entirely in the process. Is Tra Kaya truly going to win? Yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah, we're still we're still struggling down here. Kaya makes his move. In one final meeting, Kai and his advisors have reunited to discuss the course of action. There have been two proposals to attack and defeat Ikeda once and for all. First, a more conventional approach, an outright political attack in the die denouncing Ikeda's factionalism, like likely ties to corruption scandals and unwillingness to give Japan the reforms the country needs. Of course, current Prime Minister Aichi will be in the crosshairs too for his failure to rein in Ikeda and his clique. Another possibility is somewhat more unconventional. By going around the diet and set using contacts in the IJA, Kainik can gain or attempt to gain the full support of the military against Ikeda, as well as trying to obtain enough evidence to rile public support for an arrest made mandate against Ikeda. While this is indeed a risky move, it is if successful would mean the definitive end of Ikeda's career and a total victory for Kaya. Military option? We should fight on the diet? Military option. When can we bomb these places? None. Okay. Just wanna bomb people, man. Securing the military veto. And in yet another secret meeting, Kyle's contacts in the Imperial Japanese Army have reported about their success, thanks to odd favors, technical friendships, and a bit of money to oil up new agreements. The top brass of the army now firmly in Kaya's side, while the IJA's influence in politics isn't as prominent as it once was. This support can still be enough to tempt the balance, especially in difficult times such as these. While the military support for Kai has only been revealed to the public through offhand remarks and other subtle signs or signals, Ikeda's faction is starting to panic. The conservatives in the Yoko Sankai have called for private liaison conferences between them, a few IJA officers friendly to them, and some represent representatives of the Privy Council to discuss the situation. Kai knows this and is preparing his final move. The grand finale approaches. Who's going to win? Could you guys actually move around here and actually win that way? You know what? We could risk it. We could try it. Here. Marines? Because since you're the Marines, uh, we're going to have you guys come over here. Or not. The NHK. The NHK is Japan's uh, prime state-owned broadcasting corporation. It enjoys a near total dominance of the me Japanese media distribution and broadcasting. From t radio to TV. From soap operas to sports casting. The NHK is almost epitomous with the very idea of radio and TV on the the African Japanese. Even more so following its deregulation in the aftermath of the Second World War. Of note, the NHK's chief executives have recently declared an expansion plan to further its broadcasting capabilities across the sphere. An ambitious plan, the NHK's official declaration enshrined the need to protect, or project and share the cultural uh, uh, values and harmonies of Japan all across the co-prosperity sphere as well to promote the ideals of Pan-Asianism. The expansion plan was met with great approval from the Japanese populace at home and abroad. Finally, Japanese people can also view the wonders of the sphere from their own homes, such as viewing the Indonesian Football League as well as the exploits of budding adventurer Naomi Uemura. Recently heralded as being the youngest Japanese individual to hike in the far reaches of Tibet. Naturally, one only needs to dig a small distance below the surface to realize that the NHK's expansion abroad is merely another tool to extend Japanese hegemony even to the cultural sphere. Japanese programs receive five times the broadcasting hours as native language programs, and all important communications such as news, such as news are entirely in Japanese. Japanese culture is last in entering the Golden Age, intelligence from the liaison conference, and late afternoon of today. A suitcase arrived at Kai's desk, brought there by the hands of a lowly bureaucrat inside hours of recordings. Several photographs and even a few copied documents, all coming from the liaison conference called by Ikeda. Ikaya successfully planted one of his men in the conference, who managed to smuggle the intel back to Kaya. The conference was closed to the public, and with good reason. The numerous attendees, including Ikeda himself, discussed their ties to the recent corruption scandals, and the measures to be taken to cover up their tracks. This is exactly what Kaya needed to deliver his final attack. How will Ikeda ever recover? He probably won't. Morale rises. What's the morale like here? Move against Ikeda. Well, not you. But this. Today, the Japanese public followed Kai's speech in the dial with equal parts awe, amusement and awe. Kai denounced once more the factionalist, petty political games played by Ikeda and the clique, informing his fellow diet members and the Japanese people about their liaison conference where they desperately tried to clean their dirty laundry with what that constitutes a borderline act of treason against the vows of Japanese democracy. Ikeda could do nothing but stand in silence. With a pinned half smile, or pain half smile on his face, for attempting a desperate defense. Much of the diet booed him, including some members of his cliques who promptly switched sides, abandoning Ikeda's ship just as it started to sink. With Ikeda supported at historical low, it seems that like it's only a matter of time before Kai becomes Prime Minister of Japan. Why are they looking better here now? Devastating blow. As Russia's killing itself. Long way down. Yamanashi Prefecture Chateau Masian Kik. 
Kikyo Gahara Merlot, it's about 20 years vintage, or Merlot, my bad, oh Merlot, Merlot. Special order by the Imperial Palace, given the date, Oda Masashiro. Nods, closes his eyes, cold, mildly acidic taste, goes well with crackers, less well with substance. Somewhere in the distance, people chat, but he can't hear it. Numbers, instruments, tools, red light glimmering in his mind, trails of fear and trembling. A voice comes closer, annoyingly insistent, Director Masahiro, uh, Masashiro. We have finished our meeting. He waves him away. He knows he knows more than he needs to at this stage. It's only a matter of time. Only a matter of time till the firm goes down like the boats in the Great Wave off Kana Kanagawa Woodprint. So slightly buzzed from this fine wine, he makes his way to the elevator, swaying all the way up. He reaches, steadies himself, pulls himself out of the cage. Tokyo sprawls before him. A lazy beats in glittering metal and dull concrete. Soon it'll swallow him too. Maybe the ride down the gullet will be entertaining. So on bows to him, even more inebriated than he is. Dim recognition. Chief Financial Officer Hisagi. He says, haltingly, Musha Shiro, wait, I wanna. He reaches to stop Asagi and says something comforting, but leeches the habit. They are both men on the cliff, and the ground is crumbling. What can he offer? Together they sit on an air conditioning unit and wait for the vermilion sunset. Wordlessly, they watch the neighboring tower, and like fledglings, kicked from nests to the falling of, falling of the workers one by one off its roof. Businessmen at the end of time! Oh boy, happy 1964, everybody. It's gonna be a great year for us. I can just tell it's gonna be a great year. Uh, I guess you guys can get up and get... Oh. oh, peace conference. Oh, who cares? The arrest. Just as a motion of no confidence was passed in the data to remove Aichi and install Kaya Okinori in his place, the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department issued arrest orders against a selective, select group of MPs most implicated in the corruption scandals that had previously rocked Ikeda's faction of the Yoko Sankai. Both stories competed for the headlines in all the Japanese newspapers, especially because the two events are linked together inextricably. The intel gathered by Ikeda at the liaison conference is what prompted the MP's arrest, at the same time boosting Kaya to the position of Prime Minister. Now Kaya Okin Okinori stands on top of a new, renewed Yokosan Kai, purged of the corruption, factionalism, petty political schemes, at least that's the image Kaya likes to paint the to the newspapers and the TV. In the truth, much work can still be done before Kaya can truly enact his grand reform schemes. But one thing is certainly certain. The interregnum is over, and a new dawn ages upon uh, Japan. Kaya shall bring the nation to greatness once more. Stagnation will be defeated in the name of progress. And Japan shall truly live up to the title as one of the world's most for foremost powers. Nippon Banzai. We lose political power, get more war support, but lose construction speed. God, this guy sucks. Kaya, the Prime Minister, an economics touch, perhaps. Well, we'll see what happens. Oh, boy. Well, this that looks quite a bit better. 0.27 is better than 0.42. Prime Minister Kaya, finally another focus. In the chaos of the collapse of the Eno's government following the Yasuda crisis, Kaya Okinori of the Technocrats has managed to emerge or emerge to secure his position as the Prime Minister of Japan. Uh, and is taken in charge of the government in crisis that is unpopular with the public, as faces a deeply divided military and must contend with the aftershocks of the Yasuda crisis. Each of these challenges and problems he must solve is if he's to uh, stabilize Japan. Even with the technocrats, the two factions uh, have emerged to compete for influence and vie for support, each with their own vision for Japan. The new bureaucrats, headed by Fukuda Takeo, and the reform bureaucrats, led by Shina Atsusa Bureau and Kishi Nobusuke. It'll be up to Kai to decide whose vision to enact, and in doing so to determine the future of Japan. The Cabinet. The first task of any new prime minister is to form a new cabinet. Close associates and talented individuals alike will be selected, and week-long discussions will be held to understand the position that we've placed in. We must act quickly to garner support and root ourselves in Japanese politics. As the other factions of the Yoko Sankai look down on our, on our fledgling government with disdain in their eyes, should we allow show any vulnerability, they will dismiss us without hesitation. Our members have given us a chance, but they will not. We shall prove the vultures wrong. Poison cuts for thirsty mouths. The Yasuda building is, uh, is pretty from a distance. A glistening... Glittering steel line endeavor built in the Neo Art Deco style with sparse Japanese highlights. It was a breath of fresh air in the endless architectural drone of downtown Tokyo, a moment to the Japanese psyche. Whether to its nobility or its insanity depended on the eyes of the beholder. One could easily ignore the graffiti sprayed on its exterior, the angry crowds mobbing it day and night, and the police officers trying to keep the edifice safe. From a bird's eye view, Yasuda would be always pretty. This is what the man who would finally destroy Yasuda Group thought. Sitting in the neon glare reflected in the taxi window was a protester floated by in a smear of raindrops. The man wrestling past the crowds and made his way into the lobby. Being slight in a building, and it took him a good five minutes to read through the masses. He entered the lobby's sprawling entrance, noting the burnished doors, and took the elevator to the 37th floor, padding through. The carpet and floor bo floorboards, he made his way to the board of directors, opening the suitcase, passed to assembled board members a sheet of paper, and that was it. 
Yasuda had been bought by its government for a steep price. That price was the arrest of most of the board, the chief officer, then the CEO, and the firing of salarymen in the hundreds of thousands, all floated away in the howling monsoon winds and rains through a stroke of the pen. They would join the rest of the losses in the storm, buffeting Tokyo, one which would soon swallow Japan whole. But what half a man if he gained the world but sell his soul? As much as I want to bomb more people, we're going to have to hang out here, man. Uh, nothing we can really do there, but... Okay, so Kita relations are poor. Because of the technocrats in power, we face additional challenges of a sizable contingent of hardliners within our own faction, who will modify the support we receive from our faction relative to their influence and relations. Should we keep the technocrats powerful, we need to ensure that hardliners' influence remains low or relations with them high. Oh, crap. No one likes us, except for the technocrats. Hardliner relations are good, their influence is low. Okay. Offer concessions to hardliners. Relations increase by 5%, so not bad. Influence would decrease by 5%, but their relations would decrease as well. Apparent hardliners increase influence a little bit more. Improved technocrat relations were already pretty good. Cordial is not bad for the conservatives. How, how big are the conservatives group? 107. Oh, we can still get them with us. The public support is 35%, not bad. In military interactions, we are at 72 and 70%. Paranoia is only 13%, so we don't really need to worry about that, technocrats. Um, 152, we just won, basically, which is very nice. Uh, how support... Increases our power a little bit more. Increases power a little bit more. Uh, the support of the House of Peers goes up a little more. We don't need to do that, though. We don't have to do it yet. So we can kind of ignore that stuff for now. Um, actually, we could smear these other factions, the Conservatives, too. But it's probably best to get better relations with them because they're the biggest faction. Independents are pretty good, too. 21% Conservatives. Helps out just maybe a little bit. I don't want to spend too much political power doing this. Like I said earlier, we do need to keep some stuff here. Then again, uh, we don't have power. And we should have hurt the conservatives a little bit more before we were able to do this. But, oh well. We need more power, too. Mm, power decreases by 2.5%. So we need to increase it going back up. Um, inflation decreased by 0.2. Actually, how bad is inflation right now? Well, it's not good. It's really not good at all. Growth will grow by 0.3. GDP growth will increase. Business tax will go down. Uh, poverty was getting slightly worse. I do not want to slightly worsen it, though. And public approval does go down as well. So we need more public approval. More public approval. I don't think I see anything else here for poverty, though. So, let's do this one. So we need to increase our power and public approval. Power and public approval. Public, eh, it's not bad. But, House of Peers goes down a little bit, which is not bad. Which is a way to keep it above 50%, which is fine. Public approval decreases. Public approval. There you go, that's a little better. That's not bad. That's not bad. Government stability is 50%. Um, we need to just pass more stuff. The best accomplishments. House of Peers support goes down. Power goes up more. That's better. And public approval goes down a little bit more in exchange for even more power. We're going to need that. Yeah, we're definitely going to need that. Hey, that's looking slightly better. Mm, it's looking slightly better. Growth is, oh my gosh, surplus of 1.12. We're already minimal taxing for the most part. I'm about half tempted to get rid of half the army right now. What else do we have down here? Approved relations. We have 225, so that's not bad. 225 is pretty good. Uh, do we have any things we can do, though? Philippines. Um, how is this looking for them? This is Spirit. Still looking okay. I want to save our stuff for so. Let time go on a little bit more. Conflict status. No hard feelings, just business. Lawyers from the Sumito are impeccably dressed. A hair done up in contemporary style. Suits procured from the finest tailors in Tokyo. Part of the art of finding tailors in Tokyo is that those who know the best never, never, get, never give the addresses to others on pain of death. It's a rich man's province. And briefcase is made of the finest leather from Chinese cattle ranges. And they have in their papers the notices that will finally end the Yasuda's death rows. And parting, as soon as temporary board shakes hands gingerly with the team, with a sense of finality, long festering limbs are being finally amputated from the rotting corpse. It's almost peaceful. Sumito will have to deal with the fallout. And what if the rest of the Big Three, formerly Big Four, object? To the winner belongs the spoils, and Sum Sumito has determined that they are the definite winner here. The feeling of peace is rapidly disabused when the legal team steps out, and to near right, Disillusion public. Old Yasuda hands cut loose by the bailout, and rival firms are mobbing the police, who are firing into the air. In the chaos, one of the members faints, and his papers are grabbed by the mob and set afire. Yasuda might be done, but Japan is not done with Yasuda. Another era of chaos begins. Crap. Are you flipping? Oh my good god. Oh my gosh. Oh, the surplus is so bad. Oh, this is so not good. Oh, how are we supposed to do anything here? 
At least we got the guy who we wanted to win. At least he's in power. Oh, they got they got a really some really good attack bonuses against us. Um, unsung warriors, it's not bad for them. Brazil's 100 days. Anarchy of families, good. And um, provisional occupation. Will they manage to pull together something? Maybe you'll see. Mm, they're out of infantry equipment too, so which is good to see. Uh, we're not gonna do anything there yet. It's terrible. They're reformist. That's fine. Don't really care. Cordial. 225. I don't really care right now. The tr tremors. The bedraggled Colonel Nauki sat in his office, reluctantly staring at his blank report. It had been weeks since he'd been shipped to this crap, all attached to a newly composed regiment and forced to watch them like toddlers. The island was everything he imagined his personal heck would be. Desolate, isolated, desolate, and most of all, frozen from one end to the other. Nikolai popped a large cloud of smoke for warmth and inscribed a few characters into the paper. It'd only be here for a few days, they assured him. You got a higher paycheck, they said. Naoki scrunched his cigarette on his tray before throwing the pen in frustration. Why'd that have to be him? Of all the poor dudes that could have been sent here, why him? He asked, receiving no answers. His thoughts were interrupted when the bulb above swung vigorously and the table swayed rapidly. Instincts dictated the colonel whip out his pistol and burst into the office to scan the surroundings. As a flash of emergency lights blanketed the base in a dim red glow, sirens blared in the distance, drowning out almost all human noise. An American attack? No, he thought. No, it would be too soon for that. His thoughts were cut short once more when the ground split beneath him, and only through quick reflexes, he nearly was saved. Looking back, he saw his office swallowed into the earth. Looking to his sides, he saw silhouettes of men scurrying to and fro, some unfortunate souls slipping into the cracks, maybe too young to die this early. Looking forward, Naoki saw the mighty runway rupture and crack into several pieces, causing chunks of asphalt to fly in the air, damaging any material previously uh, spared. Only after a few minutes of the shaking stop, the base was rendered unrecognizable. Electricity lines were cut or tangled together, B buildings were leveled or rapidly crumbling, and the ground lay fractured with large gaps in several places. He laughed, perhaps too loudly, it was really a hack on Atatsuto. It should be something to write about, though. Alright. Conceal the berries. Uh, at forts. Bomb three states at a time. I already chose this one, but three more Japanese divisions will show up, but they never showed up. Well, with this one... Oh, okay, so now they just have lots of fans. They got more organization. And better training reduction penalties, which is actually very, very nice, but still. You can honestly use guns, but I'm not gonna give him I'm not gonna spend political power there. I'm sorry, but I'm not. Defense and entrenchment? I'd rather they keep doing that one. Hmm, we can't even get down there. We can't get it down here too. Can we send him more oh maybe we can send him more divisions that way. No, we can't. What the heck are, what are we supposed to do? We can't get down here, can we? Oh yeah, we can now. Why now? Is it because they, they, they don't have ships down here, maybe? Maybe. Hard times are yet to come. Mr. Nakamura, a hard-working father of two girls, dragged his feet through the door of his small home silently with dread. He shrugged his coat off and threw it on the rack before pinching his nose and leaning against the closed front door. His family were distracted in the house, but he was suffering with panicking, heartbeats, and singing anxieties. Uh, singeing anxieties as he curled up in the dark corners of his home, as a result of recent economic chaos raging throughout the empire. He was one of the countless salarymen fired without a moment's notice, as an emperor, or employer, sought to make cuts to survive, leaving him without a stable job or income. The news hollowed out his chest when it was broken to him, and the thought of telling his family that they could no longer pay the bills was killing him every breathing second. They had very little savings. It would mean defaulting on the mortgage and going homeless. Two beautiful children and his loving wife in the streets because he couldn't look after them, he thought, defeated as his eyes glossed over. Barely pulling himself together, Mr. Nakamura crawled out of the darkness, out of the hallway shadows, and into the living room to embrace his daughters and kiss his wife. He held them tight, knowing that they were all he had left in this world. The walls of the room looked alien to him as he understood why they wouldn't be his for much longer. His lip quivered and throat stiffened. They would have to find out soon that he had failed them as a father, as a husband, and as a man. It's been a bad day at work, my friends. Been a... Did we actually win here? Hold on, hold the phone, hold the flippin' phone. Can you guys actually win? Hold, 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 hold on. Can we actually win here? Uh, if you force the attack, that's pretty darn risky. I don't really want to force it. If these guys can move over fast enough, that'd be really good. The Marines are very, very weak. But let's take a look here. Appeal to the hardliners. With rub our back. I like back rubs. New face. And deal with the devil. Oh, crap. Or on her own. Which I do kind of like that route. That looks really nice. Forge your own path. Standing tall. Leading by example. Ooh, admin efficiency begin to passively improve, too. 
and ruled by our viewer Nun. Versus Rio Politic, talk with Ikeda, listened with Kido, bend to pressure, or pragmatism reigns supreme. I kind of like the middle one. The middle one seems really strong because I like the whole forging your own path thing. But let me know in, in the comments below which route should we go? Hardliners on her own or Rio Politic? Let me know which way we should go and which we'll begin with the next episode next. But hey, our growth is really god awful. Everything is in Japan is, seems like it's finally falling apart. And uh, that's, that's not very good for us, is it? But hey, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below. Let me know which path we should go, and I'll see you tomorrow when we're going to probably end up having a deficit and blowing up the economy even more. Thanks for watching. Have a great, 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 great Japanese rest of your day.